All good to go. Well, good morning, the warmest of welcome to our official council meeting today. Let me do my chains correctly. Thank you for everyone that is joining us today. Also a warm welcome to people online. I'm gonna ask Councillor Seymour to open our hui for us. Thank you, Madam Chair. Lord, we ask that you stand beside us as we do take decisions for our community. We ask you to, as we think of those who are unwell and for those who have lost loved ones recently, thinking of those who are putting their name forward for something that is really important to our communities and doing it across New Zealand. Let us help, help them to make the right decisions to be available to the council and to the community in the months ahead. We ask this in the name of Lord Jesus Christ, amen. Amen, thank you for that. Okay, apologies. I have an apology from Councillor Warsnop. Moved by Councillor Seymour, seconded by Councillor Hughes. All in favour? Contrary, carried. Thank you for that. Any declarations of interest for today's meeting? If not, I'm going to take you to two sets of minutes. So we start on page five. Moved by Councillor Burdett. Take a look. So I've got two sets here, which I will, if people are happy, I'll pass them as one. Seconded by Councillor Faulkner. I'll just give you a few minutes to take a look through them if you've made any notes. So it is up to page 31. So it is be between, oh, I've got a wobbly table. Heather, it's going to drive me nuts. I've got a wobbly table. Um, anyway, we're still on our minutes. Any questions? Councillor Seymour, thank you. Heather, I'll just tough it out. Thanks, Madam Chair. My, I've just got a query on page 38 um, in response <coughs> to questions that staff advised and recognising that this is, you know, some time ago. It's around the Makarori um, Beach Management Plan. And I just wondered, um, have we caught up or um, what's the process? Well, page, are you on 28? 38? But that's not part of the minutes. Sorry, which isn't either. It's um, yeah. it's in the next. I sort of had my pages turned over, and I that's all good. Well, if there are no more questions in regards to the two sets uh, sets of minutes, I've got a move in, Councillor Bedet, second in, Councillor Faulkner. All in favour? Right. Contrary, carried. Okay, Councillor Seymour, we move to page thirty-two. Councillors, and this is the committee uh, recommendations, and as you can see, it is our. Regulatory, regulatory committee, which consists of Councillor Seymour, Foster and Farihanga, who sat on this bylaw um, and Councillor Seymour, the speed limit bylaw. And you can see the minutes is just attached there for your information. And so I open it up if there are any questions. Councillor Seymour and then Councillor. Yeah, thanks, Madam Gregory. Chair. I'm happy to move um, that this recommendation, which appears on page 43, is adopted. But what I wanted to draw councillors' attention to are the matters considered and the reasons for the decision, which appear on the page before on 42. Because it, um, you do have um, covering on the submissions that were made to the meeting, and that's um, in the material as well. But there was, and there has been, you've all heard it, substantial request to remove cars from our beaches across Tairapiti in, in a number of areas. I don't think the council's in a position to undertake that and manage that right now. And there was a recommendation in the staff paper that it be 20 Ks on the beach. Then there were a number of submitters who sought to have them removed altogether. But I will mention that was one submitter that thought the way the paper was written, we were going to require 20 k's on the state highway and that um, caused them some concern. So no, we drew that it was not, <laughs> not the intention, it said 20 k near beaches. So the recommendations are that it be 5 k and the reason that the panel chose to select 5 k is because it is going to be a lot easier for enforcement to see that a vehicle is doing 5 k than were it to be doing 20. So I guess we'd have to say it's an interim step till the day the councils are able to restrict vehicles on beaches completely, but it's an interim step. And again, council officers asked that we prioritise where the work should happen. And again, consistent with um, submitters 
reprioritise the speed reduction around schools. So I ask that council support us. Happy to move it. Thank you for that, Councillor yes. Seymour. Councillor Gregory. I think you just wanted just to stand up, it's Council today. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask about the beach races on Makarori Beach. What happens with that? So through, through, through you, you. Uh, there is a separate consent that covers that activity. So, I mean, in essence, technically, while they're racing, they would be exceeding the speed limit, but the police would not enforce that on the basis that there was a resource consent in place and a safety management plan that covered that activity. We can set temporary speed limits, but that's only to reduce the speed limit, not increase it. Councillor Robinson, thank you. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I concur with all the, the reasons and rationale set out in the paper, but I just wonder whether five kilometres an hour is actually measurable. I know in my old car, when you kick it up in the morning, the auto choke kicks in and it won't do five kilometres an hour, it'll go about seven or eight or nine, just on its own manual, on the auto choke. And I just wonder whether 10 kilometres an hour, in fact, isn't a more sensible speed because five kilometres an hour, you, you are literally barely moving, you're barely out of park, I mean. But isn't that the intention? No, the intention is for vehicles to tra travel safely on the beach, not for them to be literally immobile. <laughs> and, and the problem with this um, issue is speed on the beach. Now, we have to set a sensible speed on the beach, a safe speed on the beach. And I think five kilometers an hour would mean, mean you would have to go along the beach in an automatic car with your foot off the accelerator because that is five kilometers an hour. That's the speed a car will do. Now, people aren't going to do that. They are going to drive their cars along the beach because they're not going to wait to travel a kilometer down the beach with their foot off the accelerator. And I just think it's, we're setting ourselves up for failure at five. And I think 10 kilometers an hour is a sensible speed where people can feel they're getting there um, but they're not going to be obviously doing 50 or 70 or all the other issues we have. So uh, I would suggest that 10 kilometers an hour, um, given we're picking an arbitrary speed, uh, is a sensible um, place to land as opposed to five. Thank you. So we're not debating changing anything today because it was a hearing that was done uh, where the public had the opportunity to submit. So we won't be changing anything substantially today, but I do note your point. Thank you for that. Councillor Burdett. Madam Chair, I have to agree with Tony on this one. As someone who's dived and driven the beaches up and down the coast and in Gisborne, five kilometres an hour is a bit of a joke. You need, to, you need a bit more than that just to get off the beach, whether you're in a car or a four-wheel drive. So <clears throat> whether we're debating the issue or not, Madam Chair, all I'm saying is five kilometres an hour is ridiculous. Thank you for that. Councillor Cranston, thank you. Yeah, thank you. I just thought that um, recommendation C could have been written a bit more clearly. I don't know what the intention is. Introducing the reduced speed limits around schools to be addressed as a priority, followed by townships of and McElroy and Clyde Beach. It kind of reads like we're going to do the schools and then we're going to follow that with McElroy. Is that the intention? Or just so <laughs> the clarity of that sentence, I think, could be a bit better. Well, can I just respond to that? Council officers asked for an indication of, of a priority area because they can't do them all at once. So that is the that, that is indicating the priority area. Thank you for that. Any more questions? Councillor Farahinga, thank you. Thank you very much, Your Worship. Um, I, I want to commend all the submitters <coughs> actually um, during this time that submitted to to the hearings. Uh, the, I, I feel that us as a as a hearings panel have come to Quite a well balanced um, uh, recommendation balanced on, upon staff advice and community want and need, and I'm more than happy to second this one. Okay, councillors, any more questions or queries? If not, I put to you the recommendations on page 33. We have a mover in Councillor Seymour and a councillor in <coughs> councillor, uh, a seconder in Councillor Farehinger. Uh, right of reply. Thanks, Madam Chair. Um, I, I, I completely hear what a couple of councillors are saying, but I just have to reinforce what a hearing process is. And a hearing process is about understanding and listening to the submission, su submissions that have been made, both written that you might not see the person on the day and oral from those who choose to come to the meeting and <coughs> making cognizant decisions from the material that is in front of us at the time. 
I urge people that have an interest to get themselves up to speed so that you can participate in the hearing panel if you have a particular interest like that. But thanks, Madam Chair. Thank you for that. Okay, councillors, uh, no, we've already had the right of reply. I have don't, a- Don't we have to say before we vote, if you wanted your um, opposition recorded? Well, then you can just say division, please. But I, don't I have got a mover and a seconder. We've been asked for division. So we've got councillor Seymour, the mover, councillor Farahinga, the seconder, Division. Okay, hands up. I have got a recommendation 1A, B and C. Everyone that supports the recommendations, hands up please. Thank you. Against three people, Bill Bidet, Isaac Hughes, Tony Robinson. Thank you, you've got that noted. Thanks for that. Okay, let's move on councillors. We go to our second report of the day which is on page 44. Who is going to speak to this? It's quite self-explanatory. Anyone have questions? So this is the discussion about just close to the skate park, uh, declaring the land uh, recreation reserve. Any questions or queries? Councillor Robinson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I just wonder, could it be explained to us and the community why given we passed this motion back in August, 2021, and I understood the gazetting was going to occur shortly thereafter, that it's taken a year for us now to be gazetting. Who will be answering that? Thank you. Ms. Frey. Uh, through you, Chair, um, Your Worship. So this, um, this process of declaring a, um, a road stop takes some time to go through the, the legal steps and, um, and yet, we're essentially at the point where we've completed that process and it's it's ready for uh, ready for completion. So I, I Can you speak up a bit? I can't hear you on this side. Oh. Thank you. In terms of why it's taken so long, it does go through a series of steps, as you'll be aware, um, to complete the road stopping process, um, not and not necessarily just within the, um, the control of council. So uh, we're essentially at this stage, and it, it has taken this long. I, yeah. Interesting question. Is there any chance in the gazetting process that anyone can then oppose this pathway? I mean, there's been um dialogue there's been ability for people to make submissions and consultation is there any chance now that once it's gazetted someone can object to this happening i don't believe so but i'd have to come back to you to confirm any more questions or queries do i have a move by councillor seymour seconded by councillor sheldrake all in favor country carried okay we are going to our Kiwa pools, fees and charges. Councillors, this was emailed out later. Public document with the discussions, fees and charges. So I'm going to open up the discussion. Who is going to lead this discussion? Thank you, Ms. Frey. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so as you'll be aware, we have a fantastic new facility uh, due for opening in March 2023. And it's really important that we consider and set fees and charges that are uh, appropriate for our community. So we've been through an exercise through commissioning Alice Heather uh, of Xanthi Consulting to do an analysis of the best approach for fees and charges for the new Kiwa Pool facility. She's now completed that. And we've spent some time understanding the national benchmark. Um, and as I've said, uh, the, uh, the, the criteria or the assumptions that we're making locally and have established a, uh, a, a model that we believe is the best way forward. 
So that's been attached to, to the report and we're essentially uh, recommending that that be supported at this point. Noting that over time, as more information and as more knowledge comes forward around the, um, the use of the facility and how those uh, fees and charges are sitting, that we do have the opportunity to update them as time goes on. In terms of the Learn to Swim program, we have also spent some time understanding and uh, familiar, familiarizing ourselves with what the best option is for offering that within the new Kiwa Pools facility. And uh, through the support of our consultant, uh, Alice Heather, we have also come to a conclusion and made a recommendation to you that the Learn to Swim program at Kiwa Pool be tendered out for, uh, for consideration by the community. And that acknowledges the, um, a series of factors, but acknowledges that the community uh, and existing suppliers actually currently provide a really good service. So that continuity, especially as we transition into a new facility and we have a lot of other things going on that, um, that we would really uh, welcome that, uh, that approach. So happy to take questions. Thank you for that. Okay, Councillor Hughes. Oh, no, I just want to declare um, a conflict. So I'm uh, Chairperson of Super Life Tide after who's involved in um, providing those services to schools. Thank you for that. Any questions or queries in regards to the, the, the direction? So let, just to clarify, at this stage in the paper, it talks about different fee setting. We go for the balance model and also that council will not be doing learn to swim itself and will go out and um, as per our procurement model, get uh, organizations to offer to us what they can offer. Thank you for that, Councillor Dowsing. I've had a seconder here in uh, Councillor Sheldrake. I'm just looking for questions. <coughs> Councillor Seymour, thank you. Thanks, Madam Chair. And um, thank you for the report and the paper. It's really interesting. But And it, we might have seen this once some time ago, but I'm looking at the budget that you sent us yesterday. And if you look at fuel and gas and heating and lighting, that's 300,000 a year. Can we understand whether we looked at solar panels or an alternative or more cost-effective heating at the time? And are you able to give us any information about that, why we've landed on? Because of about 300,000 in year one, it is certainly going to be something that will go up all the time. Thank you. Through your worship, just a uh, related agenda item is the recommendations around the um, better off funding and in the recommendations we've recommended 800,000 to go towards solar panels for that very reason to help offset some of the additional operational costs. Yeah, thank you. I, I didn't see that, but I just wondered, did we did we look at it in the early stage so we have a balance and we understand what that might mean because they are expensive to install but one, and they do need quite a lot of maintenance in a coastal environment, I understand as well. So of washing to keep them effective. Yes, um, through, through your worship, we did look at that. Um, so we can we can bring a bit more detailed information uh, back. That was, so we had the priority list as we went through and as our, if our contingency remained the same, we would add to the list. And so um, solar panels was one of the, probably about three down before the, um, after the hydrotherapy pump. Thank you. Councillor uh, Robinson and then Cranston, thank you. Thank you. Um, I don't accept the uh, balance model proposed fees as we as my um, rationale at the uh, workshop the other day. Um, and although this report, and I'm glad it's been made public, um, does purport to benchmark off a range of other centres and it lists them there, um, I don't understand that this report takes into account the particular demographics of those centres and this community. Now, the paper clearly says the aim is to balance between um, meeting our community's needs and, and recognizing our community is, is challenged. Uh, a lot of our community is challenged financially and providing a service for them uh, and not pricing them out. But I really fear that at um, $5.80, uh, we are pricing people out. And I do know that the range, the benchmark range is from five to $8.10 at other centers. So um, there is at least some president, if we're looking for a president, uh, that we could charge $5 for a visit. And also at the workshop the other day, we asked for a community services card aspect to be brought into these fees, and I cannot find that in here. Um, so I, I don't support 
the option to balance model. I don't think it, I, I think it's too much of a step up uh, for individual families. I don't think it captures fully uh, the demographics of our community who we are trying to encourage to use the pool, um, particularly when data and statistics would say a lot of that demograph is at risk um, from not being able to swim. So, and, and come in maybe larger groups when they use the facility. I think there's more work to be done on this paper. Um, I'm relieved that we're not opening the pool next month and we're trying to set the fees now. This is March next year. And I would like us to do a bit more work on this because I don't think <coughs> this is enough information for us to rightly say we've hit the mark for our community. I had another hand, Andy Cranston and then Meredith and then Councillor Foster. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, it is a big number operation and we have to be aware of that. Um, projected income, we've got 1.5679 uh, mil. Um, that does have to stay reasonably high because the net operational cost at 850, if that goes lower, that goes up. So for someone like me who uses the pool quite a bit, I pay to use the pool, but I also pay through my rates. So it's kind of a double whammy. So I think to be fair to non-users, we do have to have an income from the pool that does relate to the users as well. You know, we can't, because at the end of the day, if it doesn't, the net operational cost will be more on the rate payer than the users. So I think this does meet the balance of the amount. And, and we've kind of always been around that figure for the rate payer contribution. And I don't think even though the facility is greater than that, the, um, the objective is not to push that number up and push the ratepayer funding of the pool up. It's about trying to find the, the sweet spot. And I think we're kind of pretty close to it. Thank you for that. Councillor Akwata Brown, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. My apologies for lateness. Um, <clears throat> I, I, I absolutely know that this is going to cause um, lots of conversations based on a new build, brand new infrastructure that we're so excited about because we've been wanting. However, as Councillor Robinson has noted, when I look at the median income of our, our local people um, and also where this place this, this brand new infrastructure, which is rebuild, is there's portions of our populace that are paying for costs of petrol, diesel, whatever they use, uh, to get across town and through town and all over town, uh, region-wise, um, is another stress currently. Um, we've been hearing about living, living costs and this government trying to support people, even dead people. Um, but fundamentally for me, I, I just feel that we haven't really considered how we could even kind of um, meet the needs of the, the high users that perhaps come from the lowest income families. Uh, we don't want to kind of put a, a spotlight on that because everyone should use a space. <coughs> It's a municipal space. It's what levels us out as, um, as, as, as you know, as every, everyday citizens who live here. Um, so I'm, I'm in the same space where I appreciate the costings in regards to rate paying this space and those non-users, et cetera. However, there are more and more people, not just low income, actually a lot of citizens currently are struggling to pay um, everyday kind of living costs. So I, I do think we need to perhaps have another consideration to how we, do this well so that all can use this facility um, in an equal space because, as I said, large populace who do use it don't come from uh, wealth. My other question was, we have um, services being provided, uh, I was wanting to ask that question actually about tendering out, um, but just to be clear, my first statement is that I do think we need to talk more to this paper so that we do ensure everybody gets to use this fabulous new Kiwa pools. Um, but I did have a question for you around the tendering aspect. So um, I just wanted to know, is that just a process we have to do as a council? Uh, through you, Your Worship, uh, it is, uh, we have a procurement plan and a, a policy, sorry, that we need to follow. I just, I'm only asking that because I know there's a lot of good people doing in that space that way, but if that's what you sure, Thank you. Okay, next on my list was Councillor Larry Foster. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. Um, I've got a question to start with. Is the um, projected total income, is that based on the balanced model of um, pricing that we've done? 
for you, Worship. Yes, it is. It is. Okay, fantastic. Okay, well, um, you know, we're talking the difference between $4.60, which is current, to now um, the proposed one at $5.80. If anyone goes down to that site, even at the moment, and see what's happening down there, it is going to be an absolutely <coughs> incredible venue for people to for frequent um, for this community in the future. When it's open, people are going to go there for the first time and be absolutely blown away. And $1.20 extra to pay to what the old site is, is... Um, I, I believe is quite minimal. So I'm totally in favor of the balanced model. All the research that's gone behind it to get to that point is absolutely valid. And um, I think people will be very happy to pay a minimum of $5.80 to frequent this awesome new community facility. So um, I'm all in favor of what's being proposed. Thank you. Thank you. Chat. Chat. I, I do apologise, and after that, we will focus on chat. No, thank you. I, I also support the, the work that's gone into here, and I heard uh, Ms. Frey say at the start that this would be, they'd be keeping an eye on, on how this is working out and working through. And I, I agree with Councillor Foster. I think it's a small increment compared to what is offered today and, and what's going to be offered come April the 1st next year. So um, I also put my support behind the papers table. Thank you for that, Councillor Sheldrake. Councillor Burdett, Dowsing, Farehinga. Thank you, Madam Chair. I come from a completely different angle on this one, and I'm in support of those that travel from the coast, from the top end of the coast, from Whangara, and there are lots. Schools, Kwangareos, come here. You add it all up on, a, on an individual basis. I know our Kohanga come with 23 or 24 kids. That's a big cost, plus the travel. So from that perspective, I just ask that, have, has this been thoroughly looked at before they put this paper in front of us? I understand perfectly we've waited so long to get this pool, but we need to be careful as to how we deal with the charges across the board. Sure, I acknowledge we need to increase the costs, but hey, we need to be fair to the region, especially the rural sector. Thank you. Thank you for that, Councillor Burdett. Councillor Dowsing. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I hear everyone's concerns about increasing costs, but the costs aren't increasing because we're choosing to. The costs are increasing because we have a new facility which costs more. And I hear everyone's concerns about the uh, per usage price impacting the most, you know, the, the poorest in our region. Well, the reality is that if we put all of the cost of this into people's rates, yeah. that affects the poorest people in our region. This affects the user. So user pays is a good off is, is a good outcome to reduce your weekly outgoings from your. Uh, from your household. It's not a negative to do it this way. And the balanced approach allows us to determine the community good versus the, uh, versus the user pays. And I think that we've got to strike a balance here that, um, that suits the new facility, not suits the old facility. And I don't understand the logic of thinking that we can just charge less and then put it onto everybody because that's exactly who you're putting it onto. For that, I have Councillor Farahinga. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Your Worship. Uh, I'm, I'm in support of the balance model. Um, actually, particularly the the family pass B, which have been which would have been very useful to a a, a Josh Farahinga, a solo father, Josh Farahinga, um, ten years ago. You know, because that was the uh, actually under the current status quo. I would hemorrhage money uh, taking my kids to the pool. So we would very rarely go, uh, to, to be quite honest. And we would all actually fit in under this category of two adults plus up to four children because I just sub one of the adult spaces with one of my other children. Um, the, the, the maths works out much better. Um, if I think about myself formally, that, that maths works out much better for me. Um, so yeah, it's there was always one of my frustrations actually about um, being a solo parent with lots of kids that there was no family pass, but everywhere else there was, you know, <coughs> even the expensive places like Splash Planet offered 
offered um, uh, family pastors, right? Um, so yeah, so I, I am actually in support of this because I can see myself uh, reflected in here and I can see a lot of my family members reflected in here as well. Um, yeah, and I, I think it strikes the right balance between mm -hmm. between what rate payers pay for and what users pay for. So I'm in support of the balance model. Thank you for that. So yes, when I read the papers, I thought, how do we make sure the costs go, like Councillor Dowsing said earlier, we do want to make sure uh, it is affordable for families, but we also need to make sure, and this is why we have user pay models, that um, the overall burden of rates do not go to everyone. And this is the same type of discussion we would have for library um, fees or for dog fees, where we do want to make sure that the cost, there is a public good, and we recognize that in our rates, but there is also some portion of that that then goes to the user pay. So when I read the balance model, I thought an increase of what is being proposed is, is um, no one wants to see an increase. Everyone wants to say, let's have everyone go for free because it is a lovely, lovely community facility. But I do think we've struck the right balance. And also for us to have a discussion and say, let's follow our procurement po um, policy and, and find um, someone that can um, then carry on or do services in our community facility going forward. So overall, I'm happy to support the recommendations as they are. I'm not sure if I've had a mover in Councillor Dowsing and a seconder in Councillor Sheldrake. Everyone have had said what they wanted to say. I just want to know people that haven't spoken yet. If you don't want to speak, by all means. Otherwise, there is a quick, quick. I was just going, Madam Chair, we need to move that we accept it as a late item. Thank you. Moved by Councillor Seymour, seconded by Councillor Cranston, all in favour, contrary, carried. Yep. Yep. Yeah, quick speak and then quick yeah, speak. Yeah, it was just, um, I'm sorry I didn't pick this up sooner. That I just wondered with the, the um, two fees around the movable floor were adding complexity to it. Um, I was quite surprised to see that, that yeah, how that's going to be determined and that because you go in there and the floor is at the right place, but using the movable floor, what cost are you incurring? So um, you've got two different price brackets for movable floor there and I just don't know how that's going to be managed and you know, the justification of it and all that sort of thing. Through you, Your Worship, we can we can look into that and make some refinements. Sorry, through Your Worship. So one of them is around the it's a community discounted rate. So you might have a group that regularly uses the pool. The other one might be myself having a function and want to hire it for some use, which is that difference in terms of the pricing. Eighty dollars. So if it's an individual versus someone that you know. So if I'm going for a one-off party on a movable floor in a lower area, then I would pay $80. If I was a regular water polo group using it, then $40 would be the going rate. But the cost isn't actually related to the fact that it needs to be moved. I mean, you go and then the floor is in the right place. You're still using the area with the movable floor, but you charge for it. You know, I, um, yeah, it you, just seems a bit strange. Yeah, sorry, I wish if you would limit the use of the full pool. Oh, so, yeah, 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 yeah. That's great. Okay, last comment, Councillor Robinson, and then we're going to move on. Could um, one of the staff clarify? So page six of the, the report there, um, it says under option one, the existing family pass brackets existing up to five, including one adult was $13.90. And then it's got family pass A and family pass B, 10 and 20. So do I understand that the current pricing model does in fact provide for a family pass for one adult and up to five including one adult, so one adult, four children, uh, for $13.90. And then that's now proposed to jump up to arguably $20. Uh, for your worship, that would be correct. Um, the current child's Entry is two dollars sixty. So, with five up to five kiddies plus the adult would be the case. Bearing in mind, this is the current facility that they're entering, which is very limited in terms of the functionality. And we haven't had to pay for this new one, basically. Okay, councillors, I take you to page fifty-two of hundred and thirty-four. I have a mover in councillor Dowsing, a seconder in councillor Sheldrake. All in favour. 
contrary. What's that? Oh, we can see it's election time. Division, please. Hands that, up. That comment is not really. I do. For. I withdraw my comment. Thank you. But it is true. Yeah. <laughs> I withdraw and, it. And my positioning on this is for our community, not because it's an election. I Thank you. And I oppose um, A and approve B. So, all, hands up, please. Who goes to page 152? Who uh, supports the recommendation as it stands? Hands up, please. So it is everyone, bar, so oh, let's do it the other way. Yep, so who does not support the proposal as it stands? So it is Councillor Burdett, Councillor Robinson, and Councillor Akuata Brown. We've got that noted down in the minutes. Thank you, so the proposal is carried. Okay, we move to our next report, Psychoactive Substance Policy Report. Moved by Councillor Dowsing, seconded by um, Councillor Seymour. Okay, any questions or discussions? Councillor Akwata Brown, then Councillor Gregory, thank you. Uh, thank you so much uh, for the mahi in this space. Um, I'm just interested to note, <clears throat> again, often in our reports, I know this is gonna become a topical thing um, in regards to Tangata Whenua's stance. Um, and, and I note on the, on the paper it says that, you know, that, that um, there was no one in that space I've spoken to or sought to, to this paper. And, and I only ask this because of the statistics uh, of use um, and the impacts of this in region. Um, and, I, and I don't know who you would talk to, be it the Ministry of Health <laughs> Collaborative, to um, the impacts of psycho substances in region. So I, I just am really aware that um, there's a lot of people you know, struggling in this space, be it some of the Whenua, but um, seeking advice or um, input from that space. Who would it be um, and, and why not? Uh, through you, Your Worship. So as you'll see in the report, there are no approved psychoactive substances in New Zealand at the moment. So in effect, our policy is lying there dormant. But you will be aware that Manaki Tarafati has a very strong focus on addiction in Tarafati, and they're working closely with a number of providers, including the Ministry of Health, on, on how to tackle this really tough issue, which is a challenge for Tarafati. Thank you for that, because as you say, it's dormant. I'm very grateful that that is the case, to be fair. But yeah, just future moving forward, what, who knows? But thank you. Okay, I've got Councillor Gregory Farihinga Foster Robinson. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, I was just wondering about, um, I do a lot of walking and see a lot of those uh, nitrous oxide, net, they call them NANs, um, and Wairoa has been having trouble, uh, they've got a vape shop down there that are uh, selling those NANs, and um, I'm just wondering if this covers that. Uh, you, your Worship, this policy doesn't cover vaping, so that would be addressed through our smoke-free policy, which is coming up for review and will be coming to the council probably early in the next triennium. Okay. Through you, Chair, I'm, I'm aware that the vaping shops sell the nitrous oxide canisters, and so that's what the policy will, and there are also some changes. Um, LGNZ is pushing for changes to be made to the legislation so that councils can control the location of vape shops. Whether that will go through or not, I don't know yet. But at the moment, aside from that, our, our hands are pretty much tied in terms of those activities. Thank you. Okay. okay. Councillor Farihinga and then Councillor Foster. Thank you. And then Councillor Robinson. Thank you very much, Your Worship. Yeah, I just really want to support um, Councillor Gregory's uh, general point, right? Because uh, I, I do I do hear the fact that the psychoactive substances bill um, law is passed at central government is uh, doesn't have any um, uh, classifications yet, so therefore it's dormant. However, one thing that we do know that is like uh, running rampant through our community are, uh, are nitrous oxide capsules and also vape. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, I, I would, I'd really, really, really like us to, um, to incorporate something, I guess, that's holistic when we're looking about our policy, when we're looking at policy, because when a regular community reads something like psychoactive substances, 
they also think of vaping and they also think of nitrous oxide, you know? Um, so it'll, it'll be really good if we're able to uh, combine these things in order to be able to um, uh, make rules about what shops can go where, um, because they're springing up everywhere. If I, I feel like we could actually, in regards to the um, how we how we approve the the design and the specs of buildings, we've had this conversation before in regards to our CBD. Uh, we've had our community come to us uh, in regards to um, uh, two dollar shops that just started popping up every. You know, and like we we do have the ability to be able to set the standard of of what things look like and, and where things go through uh, through our regulations. I, I feel like we do have tools there to be able to use. I, I would like to see us kind of use them more holistically in order to be able to troubleshoot these things within the tools that we have, rather than us going, "Hey, we need we really want to restrict vaping." Okay, we'll go to LGNZ. They'll fight central government on behalf of us. I'm sure we would have something, something within our our ability, our uh, our, our tools to actually um, do something now. Because as we've seen, a lot of those uh, two dollar shops have closed down that 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 uh, really ugly yellow one in the middle of town. You know, like that. That's such an eyesore in the middle of our CBT. We could have gotten ahead of that way earlier. You know, um, and I'd really like to see us kind of do something, do something now in regards to nitrous oxide and vaping in the psychoactive substances space. I, 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 and I, I take it for granted in regards to that we can't do anything outside of psychoactive substances in this bylaw. I'm, what I'm talking about is something more holistic within the things that we can do. So that's what I'd like us to, um, that's what I'd like to urge us to do as a council. Thank you for that. I have Councillor Robinson Dowsing Burdett. <coughs> Madam Chair, I was just wondering, um, so we brought this paper back to refresh the policy or continue the policy, but was there a lifespan of this policy? I was a bit um, wondering why this paper was before us. The policy exists. I didn't seem to understand it had a termination period date and therefore we need to renew it. It was just so a given that it was an... For, through you, Your Worship. Technically, we are supposed to review the policy every five years, but it is one of those policies that does stay intact, even if we miss the review period. So we, we did miss the review period because the policy is more than five years old, um, but it stayed intact. We had a small window of opportunity to revisit the policy and bring this paper to council. Um, so that will be intact for another five years without needing a review. Thanks for the explanation, Joe. Okay, I forgot about Councillor Foster, so I'm going to slip him in for you, for you Councillor. You are always so gracious. Yeah, it's just like you always slip me back in. Place. You are just so, always so gracious, <laughs> Councillor Dowsing. So I'm just going to use that opportunity again. Yeah, thank you. Um, <laughs> I have, having been involved with the original policy back in 2014 and going through all the um, public um, outcry with, um, with what was happening with, our, with the psychoactive shops that just popped up all around the place uh, and what, how it transformed our CBD and the people in it uh, was absolutely disgusting. And um, so I was really supportive of having a policy like this originally to um, help contain that. And lo and behold, they disappeared overnight um, as government legislation enforced um, the public outcry. So, um, you know, I, I, I know this policy, but, you know, the first thing when I read this paper, the first thing that came to mind was vape shops because um, we're seeing a lot of different um, uh, things happening within those vape shops and uh, now with nitrous oxide and you'd, you'd think that um, if they can get away with that, then there'll be other stuff that'll come before we know it. So, for me, this is an opportunity to um, I support Councillor Fahinga and um, many of the others that have, um, have mentioned about this because, it is an opportunity to um, use this tool to, to limit what, what, our, um, what our community might be in for in the future through the, through the vape shops, you know? So, um, yeah, I, I, um, I'm happy to pass this, but I would like to um, know that we've got a future focus on what's coming next because it's going to come. Thank you. Yeah. Councillor Dowsing. Thank you. Yep. Uh, Lots to talk about psychoactive substances in context of the broader definition. You know, uh, vapes are a psychoactive substance. So is coffee. So is a number of other things. It's a, it's simply a drug that 
alters the way you perceive um, or, or that alters your perception. So in the loosest definition, this could be applied to everything, but in reality, it's completely government led and it's about what is legislated as a psychoactive substance and banned essentially. Um, it's dormant because we have no control over it. It's, it exists because it needs to be on our books, but the, uh, the relevance of it and our ability to influence this, to apply it to vaping or to $2 shops is <laughs> not really, uh, not something in our control, unfortunately. Uh, if we wanted to have policy about that, it needs to be addressed in another manner. Um, yeah, happy to, happy to move it and um, yeah, that's it. Thank you for that. Councillor Burdett. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Listening to my colleagues, you know, this is serious stuff. I walked across from my house on Tuesday to a tangy, and I was absolutely appalled and shocked at those standing around vaping. I said, good God, is it, is it our responsibility to do something about this? As I walked out the gate, there were three young chaps there hanging onto a bottle of Steiny, and you could smell the deck before I got out the gate. So, <clears throat> you know, this, this is a bit close to home for me in terms of the vaping, what, if anything, can we do by reducing the number of outlets in the city? Because that's where most of it comes from. Thank you for that. I have Councillor Seymour and then Councillor Cranston. Thanks, Madam Chair. Um, my comments are consistent with Councillor Dowsing's and now Councillor Burdett's raised the same thing. <coughs> but what I was really going to say, and Ms Noble touched on it briefly, perhaps for everyone's benefit, including those listening and reporting, <coughs> can we just understand that um, when the smoke tree policy or the smoke policy is coming back in the new year? So could we uh, allow Ms Noble just to elaborate on that a bit so people understand that vaping is, is, is not part of this policy, but what we are going to do about it? Thank you. Thank you for Thank that. You. Councillor Cranston. Oh, uh, Ms. Noble, sorry, I'm a little bit okay. fast through here, Your Worship. Yes, so the smoke free policy does include vaping. At the time that we last, um, well, when we put the policy in place, the advice from the Ministry of Health is, was quite different to what it is now. They, um, they didn't see any concerns with vaping. They, they kind of were advising councils to leave it out of their smoke free policies. It wasn't something we needed to consider. However, we have been in discussions with um, health officials and also with the police um, about vaping. So we're already starting those discussions early and we will come back to the, to the new council with some advice probably early in, in the new year as you've advised. I had Councillor Cranston, thank you. Yeah, thanks. I mean, um, the vaping thing, it's, it's such a frustration and I hear what Councillor Dowsing was saying, but I mean, the psycho, we didn't learn from the, the psychoactive substances when vaping started appearing about the same time as we were trying to get on top of that. It came through on the basis that it was going to be a smoking cessation sort of thing, but it's got out of control now. It was on TV last week and the week before about young kids, the absolute masses of money that was going out of their pocket for one thing, but they were identifying addiction. They were absolutely identifying addiction. So... For me, it's very frustrating that we saw it happening with the psychoabsences. We saw all the problems. We saw vaping coming and we sat there and now what are we up to 23 shops or something? So it is really frustrating that we can't sort of have some teeth in the matter and, and get on top of these things. And by the time they get to 23 shops, it's really hard to get on top of them. It's pretty much impossible. But if it was two shops or so and we took the actions then, perhaps we could have done something. So. Uh, yeah, nothing really apart from just sharing my frustration on the vaping because I don't get it. I spoke to a, a mayor last week who said to me in Australia, um, they started also with the, the, the vaping is for cessation and you needed a script to get it from a specified shop. So it wasn't like our kids nowadays that you, doesn't matter if you go and buy some chippies at the dairy, it's in your face. So um, unfortunately, we, not we, our country has the, let this one slip, but that's not the only thing we are worried about. We've spoken to local government New Zealand saying, please, as a nation, we need to address vaping. And that's what we did through our remit. But also while I was sitting here, I got an email from um, Minister Kiri Tapu Allen, where we as a council supported the alcohol 
um, um, harm minimization bill. That's another issue in our region where we have local bylaws that restrict the number of outlets that can be in our region, but then uh, our bylaw have no teeth when uh, a, a appeal process, a national appeal process can overturn that. And it's the same issue we face with pokies. So for us, we are saying as a region, we want to have bylaws that our community can have local say and local input and we take ownership of it. But at this stage, there's a semblance of control from us, but really it is nationally controlled. So we need to keep on, keep on pushing the ways we do. But in the meantime, we do have these bylaws for us that we can try and do in, in the sphere of what we are allowed to do. So I hear all the frustration and I absolutely share that. Councillor Sandra Faulkner. Thank you, Your Worship. Just a quick point, and it comes back to Councillor Gregory in her uh, conversation around nitrous oxide uh, in particular. And I understand the wider implications of the smoke-free approach that we can take as a council. Um, but I find it rather ironic that we are looking at taxing farmers for, for their livestock and, and land emitting nitrous oxide. And we're selling the stuff to our young people to inhale and go up in smoke. That's burn. That is burn. Anyway, I think everyone had had an opportunity to say what they wanted to say. I've got a mover and it's just a noting report approves the re-adoption of our uh, substance policy. Moved by Councillor Dowsing, seconded by Councillor Seymour. All in favour, contrary, carried. I take you to page 71, quite straightforward. I need to make sure all councillors have the AGM in their diary. There's an expectation that we all attend that. We are the 100% shareholders of this company. I expect to see every councillor there. Moved by Councillor Burdett. Seconded by Councillor Akuata Brown. We need hands in the air because you are appointing me to be voting on our behalf. So we have a mover, seconder. We also saying we have uh, the uh, auditor, um, the fees, and uh, to deal with any other business that will be brought before the meeting. Hands up. What's the, what's the issue either? Um, okay, so someone nominate them. I nominate Councillor Sheldrake, who will sign the uh, form on behalf of council, which then makes me the voting party for us, are people happy with that? Yeah. Councillor Sheldrake, are you happy with that? Yes. Oh, no, 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 I've now put, um, no. We're going to meet you the the Do we have I a meeting? Be here on the okay, all good? Yeah. I just jumped in, I just thought the person sitting right, right next to me, it's just a councillor that needs to sign it. So all good with that? Yeah. Okay, well, I just jumped that on him. Um, <laughs> Anyway, if you are happy, everyone's happy, hands up. So you appoint me to vote on our behalf and we have got five issues that we're passing on page 72. It is carried unanimously. Thank you, um, Heather. Are we going to have a cup of tea before we do this? Yes, cup of tea. We'll be back. Uh, Um, Heather, are we online? Yes. Thank, you. Thank you. We are on page 77 of 133. We are talking today about the better off funding. And I will hand over to our CEO and our lovely Yvette, who will talk to us about this and um, take it from there. So you will see that it is really cut into a small chunk and then a big chunk to come later. So this is just setting the path for us. So I'm passing over to Yvette. Thank you, Yvette. Just microphone on and you can leave it on for the rest of the paper because people will be asking questions. But I'll hand it over to you to do a quick um, update to us and then I'll open the floor for questions and queries. Oh, kia ora, your worship. 
Um, so we had, oh, I've got the clicker. <laughs> so we had a, a workshop uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, and wanted to just um, re quickly refresh because there seem to have been some um, misconceptions about exactly what the decisions are today that, that we are asking council for. Sorry, I, my eyes aren't good enough to see my tiny text. <laughs> So just to be really clear, the better off funding um, is part of the three waters reforms. It's got uh, split into two tranches of funding. The smaller tranche, which is 7 million, is what they're seeking proposals for now. We will have to do a, another proposal um, for the July 2024 tranche of funding, which is much more. It's a $21 million hit. So, we are only asking for decisions today about tranche one funding. Uh, the other key point is that we've had um, engagement with EWI has been a requirement of this, of this funding. Um, and the funding proposal is due, if we want to get hit the September date, it's due by the end of August. Just wanted to go through a couple of the issues that we've experienced with this. It's, it's, it's a tragedy. <laughs> The timing of this is, is tragic in terms of the uh, local government election cycle and the impact that that has on when you are meeting and you know this is the last meeting so we have been running to try and get something um, to you for a decision but we're also mindful um, that there will be a new council um, in, in November and not wanting to sort of commit them to massive um, significant shifts uh, in, in terms of policy and, and direction. And that also there's been a lack of time for us to really um, engage with the community fully on what, what, this, what this tranche one funding would look like. But we didn't want to miss the opportunity of actually going into uh, putting an application forward this time round because we don't know what's going to happen after the central government election next year and whether this is going to still remain a, a, a thing, you know, if better off funding is still going to be there. Uh, so we are trying to manage risks all over the place and the solution that um, we came, arrived at was what is the bare minimum that we have to do, which was the engagement with the iwi and um, getting some form of decision from you. So we chose that the process that we were safest at was to uh, look for those projects that are actually within our LTP already that have got some community support behind them that we have talked about or that are in the strategic plans of iwi and are really important um, part of what iwi authorities are doing. So the, what the, the guts of it is that the funding will enable these projects to be brought forward um, and to to make them higher quality, essentially, so they are enhanced, and in that way, there is no no community consultation required. In fact, consultation would be disingenuous, really, because um, there's not enough time to change anything, and um, we'd be asking people about things that we already know in terms of priorities. So, tranche two is very different. Uh, tranche two will require us to have adopt a partnership approach with the uh, iwi to identify and decide priorities. So that's um, good that we've got time to roll that out and to, and to think about that. And there is a great opportunity for us to engage with the community through our long-term plan process. So we'll be in a comfort zone there a little more. With, and that is for the much bigger parcel of funding. And so that's how we arrived at these um, projects that are, um, the projects on the, left as you look are uh, the ones that we're recommending the projects on the right have been considered um, and um, they're yeah and I'm going to leave it at that and allow and ask any questions thank you all everyone's waving out at the next start with Councillor Kwarehinga and then Councillor Foster I should uh, use you. my microphone thank you very much your um your your worship the um the it's it's uh it's it's hard to to not feel trapped actually in yeah. regards to one accepting the tranche one funding uh in, in spite of uh our 
our feelings around the whole uh, three waters process. And then also in terms of track by, by this process for, to another process in regards to what we deliver out. Um, so yeah, but um, the, those feelings aside, um, one thing that I'll, do, oh, first off, I, I really think the things, the projects that we've identified in track one are really great. You know, they're, they're, they're really great, particularly uh, remediation of Hawaii Tsuranga. Uh, and the cycleway connectedness stuff. Well, what I'd like to ask is there the ability to be able to include Algon connection in that cycleway, because there's no cycleway that connects those schools in Algon um, to anything over this side. I do know that there are current discussions happening with Mr. Lyons, Healthy Families East Coast, uh, other other Rōpū, uh, Rōmokakata, in regards to possible um, connecting up of that suburb, mm. and I think that would be really, really important for the connectivity of our entire city yeah. if that, if Algon was also included in that thinking. So I'd like to know if, if there's the ability to include Algon in that, in that space. Thank you. Thank you, Uh Yeah. Uh, there is, with the portion of funding that we've got, uh, we've tried to uh, put forward projects that are pretty much shovel ready and ready to go or could, you know, could be rolled out, bearing in mind that we've got a huge active transport network to build. Um, and so there is, as, as Councillor Seymour indicated at the workshop, there's the Tolaga Bay um, clip-on bridge, there's Algon, there is the Manutuke 2 and Nuriwai into town um, route. There are a number of bits of the cycle network that are missing. Um, the reason that we looked at the Rutene Road one was because 43% of the population is sort of sitting in that Kaiti um, area. Um, and it is a long way across the road, across to the high schools, lots of primary schools on the way. There is also, um, an opportunity to try or separate a cycleway because there because it's pure, because it's mainly residential area so there's not a lot of businesses so in terms of a separated cycleway technology it would work reasonably well through there and there's no off street um, on street parking requirements of a better business might have for instance so um, we just we we looked at routine as being the, um, something that was ready to go does not say that algam couldn't it's up to you guys to decide what you want to do um yeah thank you for that to see you want to respond also in regards to the possibility of our good being included in that in that space yeah i think um through your worship i would my advice would be that we as um Yvette was saying we need something that's shovel ready and we've already done a bit of planning and that in the routine area um, when we were looking at the stormwater, I think that became one of the issues. I think it'll take a little bit more time um, in terms of Elgin. I think that that's something that we should be thinking about in terms of the larger tranche of funding as a wider water connections as well and engage with the community potentially on that. So I think it's problematic to throw it in at this stage. It's possible, but problematic. Thank you. I have Councillor Foster and then Councillor Seymour. Yeah, um, yeah, I'm totally supportive of um, of these projects that have been outlined here with um, Trans One. I think um, it's a good fit. It's a it's a good mix. Um, it does um, suit a lot of different people in the community as well. Um, but I would like I would like to be elaborated a little bit more on the <coughs> trial of the East West Temporary Cycleway. Um, you know, we're we're approving something, and I'm not quite sure what what we're doing here or where it's going. Um, what the route is. We've spent a lot of money over the years trying to figure out how we get um, our pupils from east to west, and um, we've had we've gone down a long track actually um, with identifying Aberdeen Road and a whole lot of other different scenarios, and it's cost quite a bit of money. So I would like to know a little bit more information about where we're looking at and proposing this trialing of the East to West Temporary Cycleway. But um, all the other projects I think are great. Um, yeah, and I do support this as well. I think 
you know, I'm, I'm all in favour of the Tarahui cycle of walkway, but I know that's going to cost a lot of money. You know, we're probably looking at a huge amount, which we haven't got at this stage, but um, I wouldn't want to uh, take our eyes off that, but if we can get uh, an interim thing that's going to work, well, I think that's that's um, absolutely fantastic. So, yeah. but if we get a bit more information of where we're going on, on this. Yeah, yeah, th thank you, um, Councillor Foster. Mm -hmm. Worship, sorry, I'm not very good at leading protocol. Um, it's quite an exciting project um, to look at actually. So it would start from, it's about temporary in infrastructure. So um, I wish that I had, I've got some slides and stuff on my, um, some images on my, yeah, it's, it's temporary plastic bollarding. So um, it's used quite a lot. So New South Wales has a really, really strong program in this where they, what they do is they trial the infrastructure first. It's rather than spending money on the hard structures like berming and stuff like that, trialing it first is, um, is one way. What we're trying to say here is that you're completely accurate, Councillor Foster. There's been a lot of investigation, a lot of thinking and a lot of planning. Across that entire time, um, we wrote the, the cycle transport strategy in 2014. Routine Road has been a route across all of those. It's got there, so now it's time to make it happen, I suppose, is what this project is saying. It's saying, let's just let's just have a crack at it because we can't, um, there's no point in doing more research and investigation into this. We just need to get on and do it. This is a way that we can test and refine with the community um, what will work for them. And it'll be things like, uh, uh, ensuring that there is room for, for um, the rubbish bins to still be collected, you know, where's the bus going to park, um, you know, all of those kinds of things. And part of it as well is ensuring those connections, because it's not just the high schools that are um, part of this as well. There's a number of little primary schools and, 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 and uh, intermediates along the way as well. So it's saying, okay, well, the temporary installations of crossing points and things like that so that we can just see how it's going to work what it's going to look like then we can cost it up and build it later on when we um when we're ready and when the government gives heaps and heaps and heaps of money for um <clears throat> climate change and <coughs> mitigation thanks madam chair thank you very much for the paper um, and it's really interesting because it would be great if we can get 7.21 of the Crown's money. Uh, but I'd just like to think maybe as we explain it, so it could be a bit clearer, because circular economy, if we look at it, can mean a 50 different things. And in actual fact, I, I would like to see us be really clear, clear that we're talking about waste to energy, because we're not actually talking about a circular economy in the broader sense of a circular economy. So let's um, as we try to share with the public what we actually are looking at doing, absolutely, I mean, that is for 2.9 million, we can deal with our waste, and that's something we really need to do and completely support. And I'm sorry this is really dumb, but I can't work out what rolling out deliberative forum means. And have I lost um, what that actually means? And the very last one deliberative democracy, climate change adaptation. So if anybody can appraise me of what forum means, I'm oh. That was the citizen, remember the citizens panels, maybe Nadine or Abby. So can we make that a bit clearer, please? Yeah, yeah so, the, so I think that the, the, the concept of citizens panels was, um, was, was um, not, um, was hard to understand and particularly the, um, how it's different from what council does. Do you know what I mean? So this, so the, I, the, a deliberative democracy is, is, is what we're actually looking at. So what we currently do now is we go out and we'll talk to communities and, it, and we'll, we'll consult with them. Deliberative deliberation is a little bit far more extensive than that in terms of engaging with the communities. So I that, had an idea of this information, but I still couldn't yeah. quite get it to fit in here. So look, can we, because I think that's great, but I honestly do think we should share with the public some of what's contained in the box on page 83. Oh, absolutely. That is what, and so the other one that I, I support all of the initiatives that are there, but how are we going to determine which Marae is going to benefit or how many Marae are going to benefit from the one million? And I think, you know, as soon as we say this is what we're going to do, then rightly we will be asked questions about how are people going to benefit from it? So is it going to be an application by grant process? Because there's a whole pile of things that Marae could benefit from and it suggests, you know, right down to 
Urupa, um, and is it, are we going to say for a million dollars, it's not going to go that far, we're just going to deal with drinking water and wastewater, or are we going to say we're going to deal with anything and everything? So I think we need to be a lot clearer so that when the time comes for people to make application for this money, we're quite <coughs> clear about what the parameters might be. So, um, yeah. And it's more, the language is just a tad more user friendly and explicit. Thank you very much. But the intent's good. And, but we have more time to read it and get to understand it than the public at large. So I think we should try to make it available. Thank you. Thank you for that, Councillor Seymour. I just want to get back to my list and then I know who's next. Councillor Robinson, Cranston, Dowsing. I will not forget you, Councillor Dowsing. <laughs> who? Um, okay, so just clarify for me, please, because when we had our workshop, we talked about, uh, well, I certainly submitted on um, low-hanging fruit for option one being uh, the curbside collection and funding that because we were told by staff that it would be about, I think, a million to a million and a half to roll out uh, throughout the town, um, the collection system, the, the canisters, the containers. So is that 2.9 million, is that proposed, does that include paying for and setting up the curbside collection. Yep. Should, so that people could hear, yes, it does. The project contain, it, it would be, I can tell you exactly, it would be the four, the four new wheelie bin system mm -hmm. would be rolled out across the city. Mm -hmm. The contract um, can be um, potentially adjusted to, to fit with that, as you suggested last time. Um, it would involve, um, the potential to look at how we do this for the coast as well and offer some, this, a similar level of service for coastal coastal households in terms of that separation of waste. Um, and it, it, importantly, it allows us to start investigations into a facility that will take this waste and be able to convert it to energy. So, so that the last one, um, well, fantastic news, and I wish it was clearer that that was covered in this because it wasn't um, really excited and have always been excited about the, the idea of converting waste to energy and I, I mean I know from five years ago um, one of the big producers here was shipping 50,000 tons of green waste a year out of here uh, that was five years ago um, does that investigation, is that actually going to be a, a desktop study or a proper feasibility study where we actually contract independent experts to work on this? Because there has been a lot of conversation in this, in this room in the last year and talk about other entities in, in Gisborne, particularly to Trust Out Afferty, um, carrying this, this, this walker or paddling this walker. Um, so, so where's that at, please? Do you have any idea? Yep, sure do. The, um... There has been a feasibility study. There has been? There has been, yep. So Trust Out Aperture Eastland Group have, um, have, have done that work. This, as you'll see by the description of the things or the activities that are going to happen under this, it's really about shoring up things like, so there's a business mod middle model that potentially works, it is feasible. It's now about saying, okay, are we gonna have the waste streams that are gonna warrant the investment over a long period of time? So it's shoring up those those waste streams, because you don't want to spend $30 million on a plant if mm. all of a sudden one of your major contributors of inputs dies or leaves or does something. The second part is around um, uh, the options for what what is the best use of that energy at the end, because you've got options in terms of electricity or biogas for a range of purposes. So that's, that's what this study is needed for, to take it to the next step. It's not necessarily, and would probably advise against it because there is a commercial potential here, probably advise against um, council being the ones that runs this, so to speak. We'd be a very strongly imp impacted party and might be potential for a GHL or a... It's only a JV of some sort. That's right, yeah. I mean, we supply the waste. Yeah, yeah. We well, no, there's leader brand as well, and Sedenco that yeah, probably yeah. supply a substantial portion of it too. So there's a lot of things to be considered. This is trying to get us um, uh, um, to make, to help us to make those decisions. All right, that's, that's yeah. fantastic. Um, is there a portion put aside of that 2.9 million for education um, for our community around the separation? Because we heard, from, uh, we heard from an expert very recently how 
nationally the statistic has dropped right down mm -hmm. to almost 30 yeah. percent separation and it's really about bringing our community along with us on this to make sure that we get that good organic material out absolutely so the i mean the the, the like you said the core provision of the the buckets and the the the, the, the things is is is, um, the easy is part. <laughs> yeah, yeah but um so there's a rollout program that's been costed as part of this as well which is why it's 2.9 million and not 2 million for instance right. because there are a whole bunch of things that we um that we need to do to, to support the communities um support householders really with um learning about this um, this process and the importance of it great that's, that's reassuring um next question relates to the solar panels um which is, is really exciting um, I couldn't find any information here that said actually the, the construction people at Kiwa Pools have said it's feasible, that roof will take it, um, that's within budget, they've got the, um, because you know you can put solar panels on a roof, but you also need all the hardware to convert that electricity coming off the roof, and is there a space built or dedicated spot where that can be implemented? Um, through your worship, so that we've been working with Apollo on this, so um, that included things like in terms of the hydrotherapy pool. Um, if we had enough money to um, invest in the hydro slot, internal hydro slides as well. So they've designed the building so that we can add in bits as we get more money. Um, and so the building is um, at its, in its current design will be able to take the solar panels. It's just we didn't have we didn't have the funding to be able to do that, and that was part of our investigations. If you want some more technical specs, I can get that information. Uh, that, that's to you. reassuring. Um, we've seen the building, and we know the pitch of the roof is is quite flattish. Um, will those panels? Do you know whether those panels actually will require framing to raise them? Because you have to have there's an optimal angle of panelling, and I would have thought that roof, from from my experience in this area, is is too flat at the moment. And and will that affect the visuals of the building? Um, through your worship. So my understanding is that no, it will not reflect the um, impact on the visuals of the building because it was designed. Um, with that in mind, Great. Um, and likewise with the solar panels and the pitch of the roof, they had designed it with that in mind as to how they were going to install them. All right. Um, the next one is around about the temporary separator cycleway. Um, you've given an explanation of what temporary min means with, with plastic bollards. Um, I had put a, a, a panui out to all the councillors saying that, I mean, personally, I would rather, I, I don't think the problem, I said, I don't think the problem is that we don't have si safe cycleways or safe access ways for kids to get from the east to the west. I grew up in the east and I cycled to primary school, intermediate school in the east, and I cycled to high school in the west. And don't say, oh, in those days there are only four cars on the road, because we bike down Gladstone Road. Well, yeah, oh, well, there's horses and stuff. It was an issue, your worship, you're right. <laughs> but, but Gladstone Road at that time was two lanes each way. And, you know, actually, I did end up wearing a car once when it reversed out of a, a business and I went straight at the back of it. Um, mind you, I was talking to my mate, riding no hands and getting some lollies from him at the time. <laughs> but the point is, I think cycleways, I think the roadway is a lot safer now and are only going to get safer as vehicles, more and more EVs with the technology that avoid um, collisions come onto our, onto our um, roads. My, pro my point is, I don't think there's enough bicycles out there for the kids to actually bike from east to west. And I think one and a half million dollars, I did a bit of maths, would buy almost 4,000 bicycles at $400 a bike. And I would really love us to help fund a trust that sets up and establishes in this community bicycles for high school students. Now I've done some research, it's been done in other countries, and, but it's- It's it been would, done in Gisborne, my friend. Well, there's and not a lot of kids trust. biking from east to west. Uh, Councillor Cranston is on the trust uh, school, what's it called? Yeah. Connects. They have bikes in schools. We've, we've sponsored thousands of bikes to schools. High already. school student bikes? High school student bikes? No. And, and this is the big thing, isn't it? We're trying to get high school students by bus at the moment from A to B. And, um, and now we're talking about making the road safer for them to bike, but they don't have bikes. And I would rather spend the money on that than some temporary solution. Um, the question. Last been, question. Yep. Questions been raised around um, supporting mud eye infrastructure. Is any of that proposal going to get then sucked back in with three waters? Because oh I mean, we, we talked you know, expressly yeah. about yeah. drinking water and infrastructure. Yeah. This is really critical, and this is the reason why um, <clears throat> the iwi um, authorities are very, um, very much in support of the Marae sustainability because. 
Marae will be classified, a lot of them will be classified as community suppliers. So they will be um, in the same way that council is, they will be uh, required to meet the drinking water standards mm -hmm. um, of Taumata Arawai. Um, however, uh, they will not transfer to the water services entity, so they will not have the investment put into them under that, um, that council's current infrastructure will have. So they are left sort of on a limb, and that is why <clears throat> they've raised this point. The EWCs across the Motu, there was an entity CCEs meeting of um, iwi, and it's it's very, um, what George said, the tension was palpable around this issue. So it's very, very important to them. So is it proposed that one million is either seed money to um, generate joint funding either from Marae themselves or from a, another large entity such as Trust Out Afati, uh, or or some government division or how is it proposed that one million actually be used? Is it one million in pipes and taps or is it actually? No, so there's a really a core cool component of this is to understand the um, is to get the drinking water assessed and the wastewater issues assessed to start with. So that would be an assessment across the uh, across the rohe of the marae and how they stack up and how their, um, what their risks are in terms of the future um, standards, particularly for drinking water at this stage, because that's right on the horizon now, but I would imagine that wastewater won't be far away as well. It's just that, that no one's turned their mind to it yet. So it would be to pull together an assessment, a report of, 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 of all of the issues and those that are at most at risk. Um, and then it would be to fund um, the delivery of, pro of, of those, that infrastructure to say the first four marae. Yeah, okay. Which is um, now- What, what do you it, call the first four marae? The first one's got the hands up, the first four- No, no. And so this is the really important part of it is that this would be decided by iwi. This yep. is not a, a council coming in. We don't know anything about marae. We don't have anything to do with them in, in terms of understanding their needs. Um, infrastructure wise, because we have not been engaged. So um, it's important that the, um, these mechanisms within iwi to deal and to run this um, and to make those decisions around that. So we wouldn't be acting inappropriately. And in fact, it would be quite consistent with a partnership approach with, with iwi. So it would be for them to decide on, amongst themselves. Okay. I think that's my last question. Thank you. Last question is finished. Councillor Cranston and then Councillor Dowsing. A bit of stealing of thunder goes on when you're sitting on this side I of the know. table. <laughs> well, I do feel bad. Um, yeah, I think it's a fantastic list. But um, like Councillor Foster and Councillor Robinson, I because I've crisscrossed this country on all the cycleways and walkways all throughout the country, I've got this really clear vision of Tarahira and the benefits it's going to have to this organisation. So I'm really concerned to see the word temporary there. Um, we've got another tranche of funding available. Why can't we allocate this more specifically to the Tarahira project rather than something that's going to be temporary, which I don't think is going to have that much impact because sort of allowing <coughs> them over here to get into town or a bit closer and along, along the courses here, it's not going to have the impact that Tarahira is. So the fact that there's 1.5 million there that's going to go to a, another area and it's going to be a big lot of money, and it's going to actually, for me, take away from Tarahira. I'd, I'd really like to see some stage of Tarahira involved in this so that we're starting in the right place. We're building on something that's going to be permanent, not something that's going to be taken away, significant fund, um, amount of money. So, you know, when I first read it, I was all excited because I thought, that's Tarahira. But then when I read on, I thought, hey, hang on, this is kind of, a little bit different to Tara here as so I was I was a bit concerned there because I'm so enthusiastic about yeah. what Tara here can, can do to our, our city and do to our tourism and do to do to everything, you know. When we went out there and what twelve years ago or something, we, we we kind of walked the route there and we were knocking on doors with people and and we had elderly people there saying, it's fantastic, this would be great. I'll be able to walk to uh, town or I'll be able to take my walker along here and just enjoy this. At the moment, they don't. So it's it's got so many benefits, and I'm really concerned that it will take away from that and further delay it. So, gee, if there was any way of allocating it more specifically to the Tower Hero, 
I know it's a lot of money, but 1.5 is a good start point, you know, and then we've got the other trunks coming to you. So, and the other thing I had was um, kind of went from being a cycleway to zero carbon transport. Is that so unspecific? Why, well, what, yeah, yeah, I know it is zero carbon transport, but the title there is so specific that it's, yeah, just, yes, just wondered why it happened like that. Just to address that that point, I know it, it's it's a name essentially that as as Councillor Seymour has suggested, the the description is probably far easier to understand. Um, it it does uh, capture the um, potential for scooters and skateboards and you know all of the different modes, not just walking and cycling now, which is why it's sort of trying to um, capture that whole idea of um, of carbon friendly transport rather than. Yeah, so that in relation to the Taru Hiro, I don't, I don't know if you want a response as to why that wasn't. Um, the land transport team has currently got um, doing some work. It's due next, uh, early next year around the Taru Hiro. So there are some really serious issues that you guys probably are aware of in terms of concerns around the impacts of climate change on, on the, the nearness of the uh, proposed route to um, to the riverbanks um, and what, how that might be impacted by that. So there is that, that work won't be ready until um, next year. And then once you get to that point, you're still only at route feasibility. And so you've got a lot of water to go under the bridge in terms of design and um, community engagement. So it was just that that project just would not be ready in time to, um, and it will be really beautifully ready for the tranche two funding by one July as was the thinking around that. Um, yeah. Yeah, but we've been doing this planning for so long, I still think that that 1.5 million could be targeted to where we're at with Tara here and now. You know? At the moment, what's it going to do? It's going to take away from Tara here because whoever's doing the funding is going to say, well, it's already had 1.5 million, you know? So it's going to thin <coughs> things, if you like. I, I, we are, if we are working on Tara here, there must be an element of Tara here we can apply funding to rather than have it separated like, like we're doing. What's what's this project going to bring? It's going to put a few temporary pathways to town and, and sort of indicate a kind of a way to get to town, but they're not going to rush out and get bikes and the old people aren't going to walk that way. And, you know, it's just, it's just so different. It's so much weaker than Tara Hero. It just doesn't do it for me. Thank you for that. Councillor Dowsing and then Councillor Gregory. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I personally think that this is the reason why communities get frustrated with councils. This is the least responsible spending of $7 million I could have mentioned. We've got a paper that has a couple of paragraphs on these items and we're expected to make a decision and promote our favorite pet projects and get it over the line today because central government's putting a time frame on it. Why don't we put in an application for seven point whatever million dollars to sit in a fund while we do a full assessment of options and, and actually apply this where it does the most good? Because right now we talk about, if we run down the list, we talk about circular economy for waste. Where is our, where is our wheelie bin collection going? Once we put it in place, what's the, what's the outcome for the green waste? Where does that go for composting right now? So, nowhere? Okay, so, so we collect it and we put it back into landfill. Then we need to do an assessment on an anaerobic digester. What's the quantity of, um, of waste from Leader Brand, Sedenko, Council, wastewater treatment plant combined? Okay, so we don't know that we might have 50,000 tonnes of anaerobic digestion to do. And what's the cost of an anaerobic digester that digests 50,000 tonnes of waste? Cool, we've got aspirations of waste to energy. We've got aspirations of composting this waste and we'll spend the first couple of million on collecting it, but doing the same thing with the rubbish. Kiwa Pool solar panels. Is Kiwa Pools our largest energy user at council? It will be once we do not have three waters. Okay. Is it, well, once we don't have three waters, okay. Um, is it more than this building? No, this, this building has 
single glazed. Uh, <laughs> the differences between this building and Kiwa Pools is Kiwa Pools is built to be able to accommodate the solar panels. We would have to do some more work around this building and we don't have the cost approximate to go. So we I, do on Kiwa Pools. I, I understand, but we're not, we're not doing it solely for the purpose of upgrading Kiwa Pools. We're doing it for reducing the carbon footprint of council and reducing the operating expense. Um, would it be better to put that money into a solar farm and produce more out of a more efficient investment? It, it's, it's not in there. The Marae Sustainability Program, as it was said, we don't know anything about Marae. So it's a million dollars that we're spending on a project we don't understand. Um, Carbon-friendly transport, been touched upon plenty, but we've had reports across this council that show on-road routes across the uh, across the region, including Lytton Road connecting um, Elgin and um, Aberdeen Road. If we if we're picking low-hanging fruit, why are we building one that runs parallel to one that was built 12 <coughs> months ago? Um, so we've got Wainui Road, and we're going for Rutini. Um, Hawaii Tūranga, what was the plan to get that erected if it's not in here? Because that's been discussed in the background for a long time and I have no idea on the status of that project. Uh, and then the, uh, Thank you. the deliberative democracy on climate change adaptation, I think uh, Councillor Seymour touched, that, uh, touched on that really well. I don't understand the outcome statements for that, so I can't support it. There's, the, the way to tackle this is not to decide how we spend it today. It is to tell them that we're willing to receive the money and it will be spent via their guidance, via the, via the outlined plan that they have, which is, you know, includes, um, you know, their, their better off guidelines. But if we make the decision today, we're doing ourselves a disservice and we're not getting the best out of the money. And uh, so I won't support putting these forward. In fact, I'd move that we... Um, I would move that we author a response that is to accept the better off funding um, under, the, uh, under the given terms and that we will do uh, for further consultation with our community and iwi to achieve the best result. Thank, Thank you. you for that. Okay. Pretty. Thank you. Probably just points of clarification because that's... Um... Oh, by the way, I didn't mean any of that yeah. as a... As, as I don't mean that as anything disrespectful to staff, yep. I don't expect us to know yep. these things. I don't expect us to be able to develop that level of detail without the time to do so. And I'm saying that we need the time to do so. I yep. don't mean it as a as, as any disrespectful no, to staff. I wasn't, I, no offense was taken, mm -hmm. Councillor Dowsing. What I was gonna clarify just in terms of the Marae project and the Hawaiki Turanga project, those just to be absolutely clear, they were the ones that were put forward um, by our mana whenua or the chief executives from the iwi as their priorities, along with the other ones on the, on the right hand side, on my right hand side on the screen. So um, that, 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 that's what <coughs> they wanted to see in there, and that's what we've reflected um, in that space. So that's really all I wanted to clarify. Yeah. Councillor Birdie, thank you. Oh, no, 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 no. I should take control of this meeting. I wasn't looking at my. Yeah. Gregory Sheldrake Burdett. Thank you. I get too much flack for not following my notes. <laughs> thank you for that. Uh, thank you. Um, I just have a question with regards to the cycle uh, part of it, the zero carbon transport. Um, supporting what uh, Andy said there. But I just wonder if we've spoken to the Gisborne Cycleway and Walkway Trust, that guy, Jason Lyon, to uh, has done a lot of work. Oh, you're on. Oh, okay. and, and whether or not that would be what they would recommend is the best thing to do with uh, 1.2 million. It, it just seems um, to put, as Andy said, this, a cycleway where there's already another one, it just seems like a waste of money. Yeah, so um, in response, um, they are working on, so council has a number of other things happening in this space as well. Uh, there is some made good progress in the Streets for People um, projects that they've got, which 
the person that you mentioned and colleagues are working on the Grey Street Linear Park um, and the Tolaga Bay extension. That was the things that they prioritised and that they are quite um, a long way down the track with getting that funding for that. Um, there are a couple of um, substitute or potential projects on the right hand side there that talk about extending and adding to what they are doing there um, as well. And so that's the, um, the link with what they are doing. I don't know um, of the other parts. Okay, back to my notes. Councillor Sheldrake, Burdett, Faulkner, Akwata <coughs> Brown. Thank you very much. I also know a good bike shop in town. <laughs> <laughs> and they'd gladly sell a bike to Councillor Robinson. <laughs> <laughs> No, I just couldn't, I couldn't let them, this opportunity go there, really supporting what Councillor Cranston commented on before. Three years ago, coming into here, I thought that cycleway would have been up and running. You know, I'd gladly park in Lytton Road and ride down it to get, come here. So I'd, I'd really love that revisit it because I think it's just going to morph, morph away. So thank you for that. Five cents. Councillor Birdie, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> if you go to page 83, practicality at the top, had a good look at that, and the list soaks up that 7.2 mil. All city centric, with the exception of the Marae sustainability, they're in excess of 70 Marae in the whole of our region. Who worked that out? If each applied, and who's going to decide? how much each marae gets. But I guess that's in response to a, the EWI leader's request that it be put there. For me personally, I would have preferred to have seen the Tapuya Springs Water Network remediation. For those of you who don't know, way back, and water is council's responsibility. How it got to be the health department, I'm not going to I know. But anyway, the pipeline broke way back in the bush, we fixed it and then made a commitment to upgrade the filtration system and to fix the network in Dupuy. Had a change at the top. That's how things work in this house. But really, I support what Shannon said. Not enough detail and how we expect it to make decisions. I mean, I, I, I think the staff have done a good job in terms of the work that they've had to do in a short space of time in preparing and putting this in front of us. But there should be more detail. As Shannon said, how can you work through some of these projects when there's nothing there, just a statement? How do you know? And I guess even staff don't know whether they're going to be successful or not. And some of those other projects, well, Weigh them up, which is more important. However, the Puya Springs is <coughs> where I am on this one. Thank you. Okay, I move to Councillor Faulkner and then Councillor Akuhata Brown. Thank you. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, like Councillor Burdett, um, I absolutely <laughs> respect the fact that this has been a, um, I won't say rushed, but mm. a cramped in style put together of projects. I'm actually really glad that Councillor Dowsing raised the, the spectre of, for me, this is a lolly scramble, completely inappropriate mm -hmm. for local government to be undertaken. It's as simple as that. Central government to be undertaking. They no, chucking the no, lollies. No, central government is providing the lollies. Mm. We're chasing them down the track. Mm. Now, I just, find it inconceivable that we would fritter away in effectively Councillor Burdett's terms uh, this level of money when we could indeed focus on one aspirational project that we know our community needs. It may be a seed funding situation or something. And certainly the circular economy, waste disposal, all of those things are key to our community going forward. And yet we are chasing down the lolly scramble across so many projects that we cannot be effective across mm -hmm. any of them to completion, with the possible exception of the solar panels. 
on the pools, which obviously are part of an existing plan. My deepest concern, though, is that we get involved in this lolly scramble, a uh, lolly scramble, and um, and then we're in a big what if. What if the the water services entities bill gets partially rescinded, partially modified, or indeed repealed completely? Suddenly, we find ourselves again with a bunch of partially finished projects and no aspiration in them. So I just. I, I fully support Councillor Dowsing in his request for us to go back and say we want to have the capacity to control one good project for our community. Can you comment on time? Please? That's just my opinion. Thank you. Thank you for that. Councillor Akwata Brown. <coughs> I'm just going to read something that <clears throat> was in the Gisborne um, District Council's uh, page. While we understand the government's position that the country's water infrastructure does need an upgrade, our position remains unchanged. We need to be assured our local voice won't be lost. <clears throat> this is when we were discussing and debating indeed this three waters reform, which for some of us in here, we're still trying to seek clarity as to how much we support um, and, and, and again, um, constituents raised strongly their opposition, and we as a council are representatives of that. Government has moved forward with this wonderful noted better off, I love the way they give these things names, better off and no worse off fundings. <clears throat> so I'm going to stand to say that I wholly support uh, Councillor Dowsing as um, Councillor Faulkner said too, because we tend to always, I get this vibe from central government that we, um, we are always going to live under this kind of cursed name, Poverty Bay, seeking for fundings uh, to do these wonderful potential projects that, as we know, the infrastructure needs, the costs are going up, all of these, all these wonderful ideas, they are, they're fabulous, look. I would love to win the lotto so I can help fund some of them too. And I know, I know the staff are working hard. They, they're under the pump right now with a number of reforms. The government comes at us again saying, look, you know, um, we, we want to give you seven, you know, the millions that they're offering, I, I can't, you know, I can't even see um, two projects. You know, it just costs things. I'm just aware, you know, when you look at marae infrastructure, the needs in those spaces, I have visited a number of them and so have seen um, <clears throat> some of the plumbing facilities, etc. so to speak. And, and so I, I'm just aware costs of that type of thing would just be seven million, you know, in, in a sense. So my, my standing today is to say to you, thank you that you have, um, you know, got this pressure on to, to, to present but I'm still kind of thinking, let's just put the money in the bank and then <clears throat> um, be aspirational and hopeful for a project that we will see over the line. Because as Councillor Sheldrake says, you sit in these spaces and you hear of wonderful projects that we know we'd all bike on the Taruhiru. It's a beautiful vista and it's a part of this bringing us together connection and connectivity. Um, and so, I, you know, in our tenure, we like to see projects come to fruition, and we're seeing that with Kiwa. Um, and so if the solar panels means that my constituents don't have to pay as much, there's my win. Um, fundamentally, the um, zero carbon and uh, constructs around uh, circular economies, that, that's huge. Uh, that, 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 they're quite big, but there are people I know in this region working on those. So how do we, you know, t attach to them, perhaps, to lead those projects? Because as you say, we can't do it all. Um, so to you today, Yvette, I, I thank you for all of that is happening in this space. I, I get excited about deliberative democracy, because I want to see more people get active in it, of course. Um, however, I just feel that the government is once again telling us, uh, leading us, showing us, throwing us, um, when it's, we need to be assured our local voice won't be lost. We live here, we play here, we love here, and um, how we do what we need to do here, that's us, that's on us. Um, so I feel like a pushback to them to say, thank you, we'll take that tranche and we'll pop it over here and it'll grow some extra, hopefully, and then we'll decide. But that's my views too. So thank you, Shannon, for leading that cure. So I just wanted to touch on a few items and share my ideas. So I absolutely hear the frustration. It is a frustrating process, just like the three waters process, which we have been part of. 
which is being done to us. It's not something we choose to be part of. So I, I, I just, someone asked me, but if you take this money, do you agree with what is happening? And, and why are you not um, advocating more? And I made a little list while we were sitting here, what groups we have been part of and how we have advocated to say to the, to the government, you are doing this to us as a small region. What we are seeing is losing our local voice we will have no accountability. We directly advocated through the media, through submissions, through face-to-face -face Zoom with Minister Mahuta. Um, we, um, both Nadine and I, Zone 3, directly talking with all other mayors and all CEOs there. Regional sector, the same, where regional councils are saying, you are doing this to us. We don't have time to input. Right in the beginning, when they started giving the $7 million here, $11 million there, we were saying, um, why are you doing this? Because I'm always suspicious when I get free money. No money is free. So even way back then, those, uh, those questions were asked. And then also as part of the Hawke's Bay Collective, we um, had different models proposed, which we could have been part of. And the government had decided that they will mandate the four areas that they want to, to do. Um, someone raised earlier saying, well, maybe end of next year, um, if there's an if, if or maybe the government might change and something else might happen in this space. What the government has said to us today, and I've just asked Nadine about the timeframes, there's no option for us to say, please give us the money and we'll put it in an account and grow it and then go out and talk to our community. This is a deliberate move to try and get money into, and I agree with what you said, Sandra, it is a lolly scramble, but I would be irresponsible as mayor if I don't put out my hand and say, yes, we will take that money because every other mayor in this country and every other council in this country are saying, and, and we've seen what happened over the last two years. We know what has been done to us. So we are again in a situation where we are forced into a small time frame where we have to try and make decisions. And I hear what you said, Councillor Dowsing, I hear your frustration and I agree, but we find ourselves in a situation where, um, again, the government is putting the screws on communities. Um, I thank the staff for going out to our iwi partners and asking them um, how that, because it is part of our, our um, criteria is to also talk to them but I just wanted to address the fact that it is not optional for us to say, oh, we'll put the money. Um, and, and also I do wanna urge the CEO, when I became the mayor, one of the things I see, I want to see in my time is the Taruheru cycle way. And it's really important to me that we do tackle one project. I know there's, um, the, the money is cut up into different sections here because it's the smaller part of a tranche that might come, uh, that possibly will come later. But is there any chance of accommodating a project like this in this so that we can still do what we are saying here, but we do have that assurance that that spine will go forward? Because already we see how our community are using the others and it will not only have a recreational and a health impact, it will also have an impact on climate change. So I just want you to respond to that. And then, um, I know there's a, a, a move on the table. I'm happy to move what we have here. And, but after I've heard from the CEO in regards, because I've also heard over time, and I know Ming Foon used to, to push for this as well. And he did say to me, he would like to see it before he dies. So um, um, I just want you to respond to that. Um, so Ming is, yeah. Ming is happy and healthy, I just, I'm sure. Yes, <laughs> so through your worship, I think the, um, because there's been a, bit, a lot of work done in that space, there are some aspects of the taruhiru that would be, I would deem sho shovel ready, so we can substitute that if right. that's the general consensus to um, the carbon friendly transport item D. Okay. Okay, who has not had a turn? I'm just going to give people that haven't had a turn yet. I've had my turn. I think Councillor Foster, you, oh, you've had a turn. Who haven't had a turn? Isaac, thank you. Yeah, I think we kind of forget that the money's been funneled in through so many places that it's actually our money. So in making this decision, I think we need to remember that, that this is actually our money that we're spending and not magical money from the government. Um, I appreciate the workshop we had and I appreciate all the information uh, provided 
I think really the only two things that we really discussed in the workshop, they were the first one and the last one and the rest of kind of, I don't really remember having that much discussion about. And also um, what I feel like is missing is anything around housing development and growth, which is one of the key ones. So that would be the first thing I'd like to substitute. And if there is a project, but I can see even in the potential projects, nothing has been identified. So, well, first question, I guess. Okay. And then that was deliberate because of the investment <coughs> that's coming in externally for housing and development. And we've, you know, we've got, we've been successful in securing some infrastructure funding as well. <coughs> so that's why it was left off. Okay. Yeah, and so on that note, like in essence, I support the first one, but to uh, Councillor Dowsing's point about having that other option, and I'd actually rather spend more money on that so that we can actually make sure it works all the way to the end. If the government does change and we don't get the second charge and we're stuck with a whole lot of figures and lots of fires and having to wear the cost of the rate payer. Um, the second one, again, I, to support that, I'd have to see a return on investment, which, we, you know, obviously in the short time I've had to do it, I don't see, either in dollar terms or in... Um, emissions terms, Marais sustainability. My day job on the other side is involved in Marais sustainability, but I just can't see how this is council's responsibility and that there's not other funding out there for that. That's what I really struggle with. And I'd rather support actual council responsibility, responsibilities like housing, particularly for actual you know, communities that are our ratepayers. Zero carbon transport, I support. If we can spend on the Tarehuru, because I'd rather support something permanent than something temporary. Uh, Hawaii Tūranga, I mean, it has been dragging out. Maybe it's just worth dropping the 400,000 in to get, it, to get it solved. And the deliberative democracy, again, in essence, I support it. I think, again, we'd like to understand it a little bit more. Um, other than that, I'd probably rather see, like, Tolaga Bay Cycleway substituted instead of Marae Sustainability and fewer solar panels. And if there's anything we can do in housing, yeah. So. Okay, so I think everyone has had a go. I'm too scared to ask if people want to say more because I do not want to see 14 hands going up. If you have something to, so I've been seconded, so moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Cranston. I just want to, if you have something else to add, um, I am gonna allow people to say something. I don't want this to drag out too long, but I do know it's, a, it's an issue that we need to nut out. So I will be flexible. Councillor Seymour. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. While you partially addressed that, I just want to reiterate that it isn't something we can say, let us have the money. I mean, we've all, most of us have been, understand how government funding works and they don't just give it to us to put in the bank. So we, if we <coughs> want to get any benefits for our community, we have to take this. And we have known for quite a long time that the 7 million was the first tranche. I would just like us to be clearer about what we're going to achieve. So we've given A, a fair hiding, B, I support. Mm -hmm. I do have a bit of concern and I'd like us to discuss with our EWI partners, the Marae one, because if only four Marae are to benefit from it, um, that doesn't seem very many in a pilot project, a which is direct request from further them. through in yeah. the documentation. And it might be that, yeah, you know, that can be managed. I completely support, um, if, and I'm not, well, I don't know that we're absolutely clear what you've moved, but have you substituted Tara well, Heron? It is in there. The, the bits that are shovel ready can go in. And, and that's Tara Hero instead yep. of that yes. transport. The Hawaii Tūrunga, that's been around for ages, and if we can put that to bed, that has to be good. But I quite honestly don't see that 400000 spent on deliberative democracy is actually a shovel-ready project, and I think we're going to be talking to our community. We're going to have a whole lot of new iteration around the table, new ways of working. So I think that could potentially be shifted to a capital part of some, um, some project. So um, I would just suggest that if Madam Chair is happy with that. But we, we can't not can't expect to get the money without identifying what we're going to do and we have workshopped it and not everybody was available at the time so we need to remember that thank you councillor falconer thank you your worship um i realize that you have a motion on the table that has been seconded but i in turn would like to second the motion that councillor dowson put forward for the simple reason that i believe our community deserves projects that get finished we spend an awful lot of time in this room deliberating and extending and talking about costs that rise and timeframes that spread out and spread out and spread out. That's why I would like to, and, and I don't believe in moving that motion that Councillor Dowson meant in any way for the money just to be put in the bank. The it's money about, will be lost. It's not going to put, be put exactly, in the bank, it will be exactly. gone. That's right. Yeah. So I don't believe that that was his intention at all. It was about focusing the spending on getting a project finished in the interests of our community. 
Yeah. Like correct Councillor Dowsing. Thank you. Um, Councillor Dowsing, you can go next. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my intention is absolutely to make sure that projects are completed. It's to make sure that we're spending money on projects that are accurately scoped and achievable. It's to not spend $2 million on four wheelie bins for every household for it to go into the same pile at the, at the um, transfer station and to increase the operating expense across council for that service simply to not be able to finish it. Um, my intention is that whilst we, whilst we are implying these are shovel ready projects, they're not. Suggesting that the Tarahiru walkway is a shovel ready project is, is, yeah, we can achieve portions of it. Well, does any, do any of those portions account to a cycleway? Or do they account, or do they just, increase some small areas of connectivity and don't actually improve the network. Uh, and I don't even know what portions they are because we have no information on our table to put that in this list. Uh, I'm, I'm just, I, I'm of the opinion that we can push back with a long list instead of pushing back with a definite and that we can do a better job of chasing out the feasibility of these projects, getting some information on the table to make decisions around and allowing time for consultation with iwi and our community so that we're achieving the right results. Putting a million dollars into things that we don't understand is just not worthwhile. And um, so absolutely, as Councillor Faulkner says, my only intent is to is to get the best projects completed, not to spend it across a lot of things that we don't know that we don't understand today. We can understand them in time, but we don't understand them today. Thank you. Can you just talk about the timing and the time frames? Um, can I just ask um, you know people uh, say in, in the uh, or um, why don't we push back? Why? I just want some more clarity from the perspective you've had with working one-on-one um, -on -one with, with, with this. So, um, and also the, the saying the um, consultation with, uh, with community and consultation with iwi. Can you please just address, or just talk to us about that as well? I just want some clarity so that we're all on the same page. So the Reference in your report outlines the next steps and the dates. Yes. The final funding proposal needs to be submitted by the 31st of August with decisions made where DIA will be making the, considering those proposals um, towards the end of September. Um, I think it's a significant risk. I think it's a significant <coughs> risk to, um, to not respond to the investment signals. Um, effectively, you're, you're risking a $7 million check. Um, for these projects so and as far as I'm aware in terms of how these have these have worked across they are you are expected to um, write up your proposals you are expected to have um, engaged with mana whenua on the priorities and what as we said from the beginning is we've taken the approach that given our condensed time frames that these were the ones based on the criteria that we've discussed that were already in the pipeline that we're already aware of that would also enhance um, the region and in doing so would um, lessen the requirement for council to fund a lot of the activities and lessen the um, operation operational burden in some areas um, and then focus on the 21 million through a proper or better engagement with the community <coughs> as we go forward in that in that space. I don't think it's appropriate. Uh, my, my view in terms of where we've been talking around our relationship with mana whenua, we have said um, that we want to have an authentic partnership. They have decided that these are the priorities, uh, albeit the reticulation um, piece is very, is very um, significant for mana whenua, but for the reasons that we wouldn't look to fund three waters activities out of this, um, that the Marae sustainability one of $1 million and the Hawaii Turanga were those top priorities. And so um, in declining that, we're also uh, declining their 
um, input and aspirations for what they what they wanted to um, in the discussions with us. So, um, what else did you ask me? Just sure. the time frame which you you've alluded to and um, consultation. And I think I think you've answered what I what I asked, Councillor Robinson. Um, thank you, thank you, um, Madam CE, because um, that was what I wanted you to clarify for us. You've addressed it in the report at paragraph nine. It says we've got to complete a funding proposal. It's got to set out key milestones, dates, costs, risks, outcomes, monitoring, and reporting. Um, we will have to provide the DIA a comprehensive plan for each of these projects. A funding proposal under the appendix A. Appendix A actually, I don't. I I I kind of get the sense I that maybe you haven't read appendix A because that has actually got some of the detail and that's the um, detail that's needed in the proposal. Sorry, <coughs> appendix A. Appendix one. Appendix one. What page is that on in the report? Page Eighty-five to. Oh, appendix one being the uh, two paragraphs per project. Is that the level of detail we would be providing them? Well, it's quite nebulous, isn't it? Hmm. Um, <laughs> I, I wouldn't have said that either because I've got issues around the quality. Um, is there a word count limit? <laughs> Less than 150 words. Look, um, if we are looking at question, uh, spending and urgent matters, can someone give us a quick update? Our CDM center that has to be built up there. I mean, we know if there's a disaster, this place can't be the center of um, coordinating our responses. Have we got um, funding in the pipeline, our $1 million for our CDM center? Yeah. Up at Litno? Yep. Can we, could, we, could we snaffle that and bring that forward? Would that help at all? Because if there's a disaster, this this place is gone, burgers, and then we can't coordinate a disaster response, can we? Yeah, through your worship, we have um, we have a contingency plan in place um, that we have shared with the Senate group in terms of if anything was to happen in the interim, which is the House of Breakthrough. Um, and we do have budget in the LTP, which is one of the criteria that um, that you'd have to look at a, an enhancement for it to be eligible in terms of the federal funding. Okay, last person, Councillor Akawata Brown, and um, then we will vote. Thank you very much, um, Chair. Um, for me, when I consider all of these things, I come back to deliberative democracy uh, as, I guess, something that I see <clears throat> perhaps helping, I guess, uh, in, the, in the framework of visioning for the region. Because in recent days, we've seen collective groups of people wanting to meet to discuss the sale of a network. And you know, meeting was held. Not everyone can make it. And so, when I look around my region now, I see um, municipal spaces popping up that are, are able to house and you know, and, and have meetings and invite people. And if we're going to um, obviously look at my sustainability, then we've now got an opportunity, in my view, <clears throat> to actually um, you know really better. And I love uh, your quoted all in the deliberative democracy on page eighty. Eight of one three four, um, you know, with regard to the future of local government, um, we know we are in a real space of changing um, the model that's been here for over thirty years, <clears throat> and the need to really see what representative and um, climate changes impacts in region and to strengthen to rebuild trust, all these factors that you've noted. Um, so, in my view, that's that's going to give some, I guess, um, some kind of guidance and some and it's important or two, because we all know what are our pet projects, what we're passionate about. Um, however, in our biggest, uh, best interest of all in this region, um, being able to deliberate and, and have a true democracy conversation, <coughs> um, to me is, is really pertinent to um, the future, um, because we are now being pressed Press more and more, and I, I got this from my conference re recently, um, to make mokopuna decisions. And so the intergenerational terminology, that means uh, we know we make long-term plans, 10 years, um, <clears throat> our annual plans, et cetera. But the impacts that climate change is pushing us to make decisions for in the now, uh, not just in the future. Um, so I, I feel like I really want to support wholeheartedly how we could do that. Deliberative democracy, um, I think it encompasses all things to do with what we potentially are trying to achieve for the region. And it will do it in a way that brings all the people with us. Mm -hmm.
which is always aspirational. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I, I, I just wanted to finish with that. From, from me, that's something that I would wholeheartedly, you know, totally get behind how we would do that. Um, it's not possibly easy, uh, but it's something that's a challenge we, we can take on. Kilda. Right of reply, Councillor Dowsing. There's a motion on the floor, which you will need to clarify the wording because I can't remember. Not the one that gone first. He... Oh, okay. Okay, I'm going to take my right of reply then. Thank you for, um, I want to acknowledge staff, a lot of rushing around behind the scenes have happened because we have been put in a situation which is not ideal. Um, ideally, we would like to have discussions over a long time with our community, with our iwi partners, and um, like we do in the 10 year plan process. Like I've said before, and I'm not gonna repeat everything I've said, you've heard me before. Um, in my opinion, it would be irresponsible for us not to take part in this process. Like Nadine said, there is the risk um, that uh, all that will happen is that that funding will just be allocated somewhere else. And also the fact that we are part of this process, again, I come back to saying, we have over the last 18 um, months made it clear to the government that we um, are uncomfortable on behalf of our community we are not happy with the process that was followed. We do support change. None of us want to see um, some of the issues that we deal with in wet weather events. We do, um, as a council, want to make those changes. What we have said to the government that the current model is not fit for purpose. Small communities like ourselves will lose our accountability. We will lose our input. So I just want to reiterate again, as a council, we have used so many forums. I could just write down four, which we have been part of, saying this is not good enough for small communities like us. But today we've had discussions here. Staff has done their best <coughs> under extremely stressful situations to comply with government guidelines and government timelines. So I urge you, you've listened to all discussion. I've moved this um, proposal on page 78 and it was seconded by Council Cranston. Division, please. All in favor. Madam CEO, can you please clarify? D. Don't need to change it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it is included. Tarueru is included in there. And we'll it's in be the minutes. noted in the minutes. It is noted in the minutes. Okay, so I move one A, B, C, D, E, F. Hands up who support this. Farihenga, Foster, Seymour, Sheldrake, Stoltz, Gregory, Cranston, Robinson, carried against Faulkner, Akawata Brown, Birdit, Dowsing, Hughes, carried. Thank you for your deliberation and also thank you to staff. Thank you, Avit, for the work that's gone into this. I know it's been late nights for staff. What, what, what is it? Oh. <laughs> what is it, a fun fact? No. Oh, later. We can share that later. Let's move on to what is on our agenda. Um, thank you, Yvette. Um, oops, oops, what was that? Oh. Okay, councillors, another chunky uh, piece of information, which I'm sure um, there will be questions. Thank you, Nadine, for an extensive CEO report with updates um, moved by Councillor Burdett. And then I'll open the floor for questions. We are on page 93. I wanted to talk about page 109 and I, I see no photo credits to the mayor on the playground, um, but Councillor Burdett and myself, you should have seen the community turnout at Te Ararua that day there was a, a community vaccination station there 
And all of us got stuck on the Kopuarua Hill. Behind, there was this, uh, a forestry truck stuck there. We had to, I've had to follow the ambulance all around Waipero Bay to get there. There were probably 150 people the other day. Families came out. It was so well received. Um, I cannot thank staff enough for the way they've worked with the Te Ararua community to get this going. The kids were playing around. There were business and marae supporting with the, the bark to keep the uh, playground safe. So I just want to, I'm sure I'm conveying the thanks from the Te Ararua community um, and Councillor Bedeck that day was there as well. It was such a wonderful community day and they love that playground. Thank you. Councillor Akuata Brown. Uh, I just really wanted to start by thanking Thanking Nadine, it's um, it has been a challenging, um, <laughs> challenging space um, in any position anyone has within a council. If we look across the nation and the news kind of frameworks wise, so uh, thank you, Nadine, uh, for, for all the money um, in this space um, and, and the challenges you face. Um, I just wanted to also thank um, James Beatty and his team helping support. Um, uh, within the framework of the elections and wanted to ask, are we comfortable, confident in that space? Um, oh, he's returned. Sorry, um, I was thanking you, James, <laughs> uh, for your mahi. Um, it's been a positive um, feedback um, from public and those in the space of uh, your support and helping um, with that um, framework to the elections. And I just had a query to ask, I don't know what's your report, but um, you're confident and comfortable that we've done everything in our space, because I feel we have, um, but other councils, of course, are still in the space of numbers wise. but um, are we comfortable that we've been able to articulate well across with the two changes being the general war, Māori wards and the East TV? Uh, do you feel confident that that's been articulated enough for this being tomorrow's the last day? Um, through the chair, it will never be enough. <laughs> Learning about STV and its implications and how it works is an ongoing journey, but I think the team have done a really good job in terms of getting the word out there about elections, about nominations. Um, I'm comforted in knowing that um, at this stage, unlike other parts of New Zealand, we are going to have elections, that all the wards contested. Um, so that that's heartens me in terms of uh, a measure, I guess, for understanding whether we've got the word out enough. Uh, Heather's just finished taking another nomination. So as we as we approach the 11th hour being tomorrow at 12 noon, um, I, I think in terms of the first stage of the process of round elections and nominations that we've done quite well, it'll be an ongoing conversation um, in terms of education around uh, the new look and feel of the ward structure, um, which we've been doing ad nauseum for some time now, um, and STV in particular and how that works. Um, hopefully you've all had a chance to see our wonderful animation that we've had the team, um, and th thanks to Anita and her team who helped pull that together and, and Heather and co. So I guess broadly to answer your question, I think we, we're doing quite well um, and, and the results are starting to show. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Bailey, appreciate that. <coughs> and my, just my second question was on the same page. Uh, will we get a, a report updating the Gisborne Rail Reinstatement Assessment? Uh, I just wanted to that was that if there is something in yeah. space. Uh, Thank you. Um, for your worship, there has been nothing said back to us yet, but as soon as I have some more information, I will share it. Councillor Burdett and then Councillor Gregory, yeah, thank you. I just rise to support the Mayor in terms of what she said about the township upgrade in Ruatoria, in Tiaro, sorry. You see the list there, and I just want to acknowledge our staff, Lillian in particular, the uh, liaison officer, and other staff that have been involved. If we go north, at Hicks Bay, the playground, and the new toilets, it was bloody marvellous to be there and see the enjoyment on those kids' faces as they enjoyed the playground. But the compliments that came that earned, really earned council brownie points and Lillian and her staff, or the staff, because it's been a long time coming. And we come back to Tower Hall, the playground is in place, the toilet is to come. I understand that's not that far away. And when you think about uh, the issues that we've had in Tower Hall over the years, council has done a great job and I just like to acknowledge and back up what the mayor said because it was a great day to be there and be part of the, both communities who were there supporting. Thank you. Thank you for that, Councillor um, Birdie. Councillor Gregory, thank you. Oh, thank you. I just have a question um, 
regarding page 113 about biosecurity. And it says, um, further work focuses on pest plant eradication species, including the emergence of two new infestations. I was just wondering what that was all about. It's spotting in here. I'm, I'm just going to have to refer that to Michelle. Do you know what the two infestations are? I'd have to come back. For your worship, I'd have to come back to you on that. I can, Thank I can you. follow up now. Ms. Frey, that's good. Mm -hmm. Anyone? Uh, oh, there we go. Councillor Foster and then Councillor Aqua, uh, not Aquata Brown. Next door to you, Seymour, and then Cranston. Thank you. Yep. Okay, thank you. I'm just at the bottom of page 115, um, external funding applications, and it's got an application to NZCT to support components of township plan upgrades has been deferred pending the decision of council regarding the sinking lid policy, which has been confirmed. Um, we've had a sinking lid policy for as long as I can remember. So why are we being held to ransom by NCCT for the funding? Is, um... Three worship. Um, we've um, written to NZCT asking for that um, uh, answer to that question. Um, they have come back to us um, advising that they are just keeping a watch on our policy and that they um, were going to reassess our proposal again in, at their meet, room meeting in August. So, um, yeah, um, we had concerns about that as well. And how, how much are we talking about? Um, what um, it's around about 300,000. Sorry? 300,000. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Seymour, thank you. I've just got a couple of questions, and one is on page 110 around the Titarangi Summit, which you know I, I know these papers have to be written quite some time before we meet. Is there an update? Because um, I understand the issues that well publicised and it's on hold. But have we made progress? And is it um, at the stage of being resubmitted? Please. Um, so your worship, no, we have we are still in discussions, and we have not progressed anything yet. Thank you. I have a further question. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry, Madam Chair. Around, and it's on the same 15, 115 that Councillor Foster was on, um, discussed. I was just at, and up near the top of the page where we have a um, fuel excise duty fund. And it's not a huge amount of money, but could someone please explain why we have 38,000 in a fuel excise duty fund? Is that I can't believe that's how much it's the excise duty on the amount of fuel we use on our boat. So through your worship, no, that's the um, through Maritime New Zealand. That is the fund that they have that will be that we've applied to. It's not our fund. Thank you. And then the East Cape Road um, on the following page, page one sixteen, and around the physical work contract and was to be let at the end of July. Do we have an update on that, please? I'll come back to you on that one. Thanks very much. Thank you. That's all. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for the report. Um, page 105, Code Governance with Tangata Whenua. I mean, it talks all about governance here, but our group is four council staff with four iwi representatives. Are they iwi governance? Or they is that a staff to staff thing? Or? Staff to staff. Yeah, it is staff to staff. OK. And the other one, just a bit further down there, um, the anti-racism working group. I think it'd be really great to have Pakia on there as well. If we are changing, you know, if we are looking at it again, because yes, it's not a one-way issue. Yeah. Worship. So we the group met um, what's today, Thursday, Tuesday. Mm -hmm. okay. um, and uh, looking at a bit of a reset and uh, revisiting what was the resolution of council oh, and how chance. we go about um, yeah prioritising the work that's required in that area and that tucky. I like the word tucky. Um, who was next on my list? Councillor Faulkner, thank you. Thank you, uh, Nadine. Uh, excellent report again, as usual. Um, 
<coughs> Under the external funding application is still outstanding on page 115, the Hill Country Erosion Project. Uh, where do you feel we are getting to with that? Uh, is this a uh, What page were you on, Councillor? 115. In the table of applications to go out right at the bottom of the page. Hill Country Erosion Project. Um, so we should say we've, um, we have applied for that and we are waiting for a decision on that. So we will know in September. Right. Once it's watered, then we'll start progressing. Councillor Dowsing, thank you. Thank you. Uh, firstly, can I ask for an update on the Inner Harbour boat ramp pontoon? Is that being completed? I'm sure um, Michelle. Ms. Um, Frey would love to update us on that. Thank you. Uh, through your worship, so we are working closely with the contractor uh, uh, to reinstate the left side of the pontoon. So that's essentially a reinstatement. In terms of the right hand side, we are reviewing how that looks uh, into the future and that might look slightly different, but we do have agreement from the contractor to get that left side reinstalled as soon as possible. Yes, yeah, so that was, that, so as soon as possible was our terminology for it five weeks ago in the newspaper? Yep, agreed. Um, so what's our time frame? So the key issue from the contractor's perspective is health and safety in terms of reinstallment and they are only willing to reinstall at a, a 200 mil um, wave depth which hasn't been met yet okay. so we're at the um in the hands with regard to that reinstallment okay because for me the the um the concern that the contractor has for health and safety is the concern that i have for our boating community who are currently climbing down ropes or shimmying down the uh the the pole off the wharf to get onto that pontoon to get onto their boats and that's including my 64 year old mother um, so it is unsafe as it is, and it's still our only operable loading point for these vessels. So uh, is there the opportunity for a temporary um, egress, uh, like the ladder that was put in place for the, for the people to get in and out of the um, river from jumping off the, off the um, bridge, so that people can actually access the, the, the floating part of the pontoon currently? Otherwise, I'll go down to Bunnings and buy some of those little yellow climbing rungs and screw them to the wall myself. But having people shimmying down ropes to get onto that is not sustainable. And with no deadline in sight for it, um, we're just putting our community at risk. So we are working safely, with, or working with, working closely with our home safe <coughs> team to uh, to do what, what we can. The the number one is reinstallment in terms of safety. Another option is to to close the boat ramp, um, which which could be an option um, until we get that fixed. The, the short term fixes around ladders, they haven't been they haven't been um, considered as part of our home safe response at this stage. So um, can I suggest that that's considered because whilst it's in use, it's being used and it's being used in a manner that's unsafe. So any way to make that section of pontoon accessible in the short term before we can address the, the rest of the problem um, is, dire, and it is you know, definitely needed. Yep. That. Anyone else that haven't spoken? Councillor Robinson. Just find my notes. <clears throat> okay. <laughs> you are dead to her. <laughs> so um, on page 105, and just going back to the co governance with Tangata Whenua, first Hui was held, the first Wananga was held on the 2nd of August. What are the time frames? Uh, for reconvening for some paper to come out of this, <coughs> some, some planning it doesn't provide us any guidance in this report as to where this is going to land. Um, that's my first question. For your worship, I might have a bit of a blank in terms of the timeframes that's coming back, but what I can say is there was 
there is an uh, in principle um, agreement from this council in terms of having a co-governance TRMP committee. Um, the group that we met with, so every representative's nominees in there in terms of a technical level have agreed that that would be the place to try out the um, relationship. So as part of the committee consideration, we're preparing that um, with the terms of reference and delegations jointly. Uh, and then I can't quite remember when we were reconvening another date to meet, but we're working towards the election um, decision uh, post-election decision-making around committees and that will um, enact the... So so what you're saying is this will probably come back in the first round of Hui after the election. Yeah. Excellent, thank you. Uh, and the second thing I wanted to note was I cannot think of too many other CEO reports which would have reference to installation of a horse hitching rail close mm -hmm. to the skate rink. I think that's absolutely classic. Thank you. <laughs> thank you that's for a that. team effort, the report. <laughs> Okay, Councillor Seymour, one last comment. Yeah, thank you. I'd just like to um, follow up the query that Councillor Dowsing made, because we have um, a well-funded position at the Harbour Master. So can I ask, in his official, I imagine, safety of the harbour's <coughs> capacity, what is his role in ensuring that the public that wish to use our boat ramps actually can do it safely? So uh, Mr. Buell has been um, working with the team as well and looking at the options. There's, um, there are a number of issues and there's a bit of complexity around ensuring we don't void our warranty and holding our contractor to account um, whilst also ensuring the safety. And so what we will do, so in response to that, um, Peter Buell, who is our Harbour Master, has been actively engaged in that. It's not his direct responsibility around pontoon management, but he is providing advice. Harbour, uh, yeah, that's correct. Um, but we will pick up on, in terms of looking at um, the temporary yeah. alternative yeah. options as well. Thank you. Any last questions, queries? If not, right of reply. You moved it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I, well, it's not a right of reply. I just wanted clarification through you, Madam Chair, from the CEO, in terms of page 114, WIPU <coughs> phase two erosion control. And I note that the uh, funding was awarded in 2016, um, 2001. <coughs> Does that fund Kerry Hudson and his team? Well, is it still relevant in terms of uh, reserves? The amount of money? Required because he's been at it a while. I mean, he's so busy, he and his crew, he does a marvelous job. We should really clone him if we could. But the issue is, uh, I just hope long term we have sufficient funding for them to continue their good work. Thank you for that. Okay, Councillor Birdit moved the paper, seconded by Councillor Akwata Brown. All in favour, contrary, carry. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Akwata Brown, your report is next, page 119, councillors. Would you like to speak to it um, and move it? Thank oh, you. Thank you, um, Your Worship. Um, firstly, yeah, really thank you, really, to Heather and the team. We um, had a bit of logistical. Uh, stress in the initial um, with regard to attending this. Um, it's always been, um, well, for me this term, it's been a real delight to be a part of the Te Maruata uh, Committee. Uh, it's been an interesting space and I've had the chance to meet with and uh, collaborate with a number of councillors, mayors and uh, chairs and politicians. Um, so it's been, um, yeah, a, a wonderful time and we have our AGM or uh, our votes as such that we're pulling it forward to after the elections. So, of course, with our Māori wards um, and uh, councillors coming into the space, uh, they'll have an opportunity to put their name um, up to be uh, elected uh, to the committee itself, as well as being a part of that for Kahire and Opu. So, um, <clears throat> anyone has any questions, I'm happy to take those, but otherwise, thank you again for the opportunity to serve in this space. Um, it's been an absolute delight. Kia ora. Kia ora. Um, any questions of Councillor Akawata Brown? Seconded by Councillor Dowsing. So we've got a mover and Councillor Akwata Brown, seconded by Councillor Dowsing. All in favour? Contrary, carry. Thank you for that report. We come to the end of our public meeting. Thank you to the Gisborne Herald for being here today. 
what is this that is not oh, those were the fees we did move um to accept as a light paper uh, 